There were 12 of us to begin with, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. The cottage hearth beams warm and bright, the candles gaily glow, the stars emit a kinder light above the drifted snow. Down from the sky a magic steals to glad the passing year, and belfry sing with joyous peals for Christmas tide is here. H.P. Lovecraft, Christmas. Chapter 1 Blue Bottle, December 13th, 2019. There were twelve of us to begin with, said Richard Ike, the sole survivor of the Miller's Manor Massacre, a string of murders committed within the walls of the mansion of the same name over the twelve days of Christmas, 1989-90. His interlocutor was Annabel Franklin, a first-time author, keen to pick the brains of the one who got away, the only one, he who outwitted the murderous mastermind at the eleventh hour, at the cost of three fingers and his right foot. Now, some thirty years later, I could finally agree to share his story with Franklin, on the basis that nothing be omitted— that his account would be both meticulous and gruesome, that it was important to him that the truth be told. As to why it was so important to the wounded survivor, the mastermind, the individual behind the murders, had never been caught. I could lived in fear since his dramatic escape all those years earlier, thirty years spent looking over his shoulder, limping from destination to destination, afraid of his own shadow. The publication of Franklin's book would be his catharsis, closure at last. Franklin had hounded Ike for years. She, representative of the masses and their insatiable need for enlightenment, had obsessed over the case ever since it came to light in the first weeks of 1990. Rumours had abounded for decades, and, in true grapevine fashion, the general public, aided by the ravenous media, had greatly exaggerated the statements Ike gave during the initial police investigation, transforming his bare-boned comments into wild, nonsensical anecdotes involving would-be boogeymen and supernatural phenomena. Eventually, though, common sense prevailed, and the public grew to accept the basic facts in the case. The tragic deaths of several innocent people, the fortuitous survival of the last would-be victim, and a killer on the loose. Outside of official circles, the case still an open investigation in the eyes of the police, only Ike had the ability to shed light on what had happened over those twelve bleak days. And there they were, the writer and her most sought-after subject, face to face in the quietude of Ike's Nottingham home, engaged in conversation. Franklin, her aging face a mask of determination, and Ike, a bundle of nerves, his chin in his hands, on the left of which only a thumb and forefinger remained. The sole survivor's account had begun with the well-documented story of his happening upon the now legendary murder mystery event at Miller's Manor on December 26th, 1989. A single, twenty-seven-year-old at the time, I could spend Christmas Day with his parents in Macclesfield, a relatively short drive across the Peak District from his home in Chesterfield. The journey had become something of a tradition, with Ike heading across Christmas Eve and returning Boxing Day. Other than the Christmas of eighty-four, the winter he'd finally managed to convince his neighbour, Lisa Rogers, to go out with him, he'd made the trip every year without fail. And so it was that Hike was driving in the direction of Millersdale, near Buxton, on Boxing Day 89, when the sprinkling of snow that had been forecast started to come down in broad, disorientating sheets. He'd braved the route in the snow many times before, but on this occasion there was something particularly menacing about the way in which the white, ghostly veils descended, threatening to lure him off the poorly lit highway into the heart of the barren snowscape that was forming about him. Admitting defeat, the twenty-seven-year-old abandoned the A6 on the approach to Taddington, and made a slow, painstaking way along the back roads of Millersdale, 
until, finally, and somewhat inexplicably, he found himself traversing the snow-covered track that led to the remote Miller's Manor. Miller's Manor is a large, red-brick Georgian mansion, southwest of the small settlement of Miller's Dale, a mere stone's throw from the banks of the River Wye. It was built circa 1750 by the Countess Mary James, of the highly influential James family, who had been in ownership of the substantial acreage upon which it was constructed for centuries. In the late 1960s, following the death of the last surviving member of the James line, Miller's Manor was acquired by a private investor, who, up until the tragedy that beset the estate, had frequently let the property as a venue hire facility, in which low-budget horror films were shot throughout the 70s, and murder mystery events were hosted throughout the 80s. And it was into an unconventional example of the latter that the young Richard Ike unwittingly stumbled that fateful snowy night in December 89. Noticing a number of vehicles adorning the vast driveway, the twenty-seven-year-old parked alongside what, from its outline beneath a dusting of snow, appeared to be a beetle, and emerged from his rust-bucket cortina in order to make a dash for the manor. He might have felt preposterously out of his depth, as he approached the red brick monstrosity, its ornate sash windows and grand portico festooned by the advancing blizzard, but, being familiar with the area, he knew of the mansion and its present day usage. He was certain that the event participants, or guests within, would relate to his plight and grant him a room in which to wait out the ever intensifying whiteout. He wouldn't mind paying for the privilege either. Stepping into the shelter of the portico, Ike rapped on the heavy wooden door, and waited. Several moments later, the door was opened, revealing the magnificent interior, in which two befuddled men met his gaze. The warmth of the manor rushed out to greet him, as one of the men, a tall, dark-haired individual in jeans and a beige turtleneck sweater, gestured for Ike to step inside. In the man's shadow stood a shorter, smartly-dressed fellow, in a colourful fair isle cardigan, over a white shirt and black tie, his face empty of expression. Ike crossed the threshold and stepped into the calm shelter of Miller's Manor's Grand Hall. He was about to tell of his predicament, when the taller of the two men raised a forefinger to his lips and pointed in the direction of a door across the hall. Thinking nothing of it, the twenty-seven-year-old moved towards the indicated portal, admiring the opulence and sheer scale of the hall and its towering Christmas tree as he went. There was an eerie silence about the place, distinct, even above the howling blizzard outside, the sort of stillness that owes its presence to expectancy. And, as Ike stepped into the adjacent room, a large reception hall, he understood the source of that unspoken anticipation. Occupying different positions throughout the room were nine additional men and women, the heads of whom were tilted in the direction of the doorway, evidently greatly interested as to the identity of the latecomer. Ike stepped into the room proper, and was unsurprised to observe a freestanding signpost in the southwest corner, labelled, Murder at Miller's Manor, December 26th, 1989, to January the 6th, 1990. His instincts had been correct. The twenty-seven-year-old had interrupted a planned event, one of the many murder mystery events that took place at the estate every year. The two men who had admitted him entered the reception hall to his rear, and then Ike, without hesitation, offered an explanation for his unanticipated arrival. In response to this, a young woman with dark brown hair stepped forward, an attractive lady in a bright yellow dress, and spoke to him directly. "'But we've been expecting you,' she said, in a tone of voice that suggested his arrival at the mansion was anything but chance. "'Me?' Ike returned, perplexed. "'Yes, your name's in the hat,' the woman in yellow continued, pointing towards a sandalwood bureau on the north wall. Frowning, Ike approached the white top hat sitting upturned on the bureau and picked it up. Inspecting its contents, he found a tiny ball of crumpled paper. He unfurled it. "'Blue bottle?' he read aloud questioningly, looking back at the other guests, several of whom had moved towards him curiously. "'That's your name?' This from the tall man who had answered the door. "'My name?' "'Your code name?' the woman in yellow offered. Ike shook his head in frustration. "'Look,' he began, "'I had to get off the A6 due to the weather, "'and this was the first place I stumbled across. 
I was hoping you'd be able to put me up for a couple of nights. There was a moment of silence. Oh, muttered the tall man. Again, silence prevailed for several seconds. Well, the woman in yellow said, since you're here. Annabel Franklin listened as Ike related the circumstances surrounding his decision to participate in the murder mystery event, stating that he willingly partook under the proviso that he be given a room of his own, a proviso that, quite inexplicably, had already been fulfilled in anticipation of a twelfth guest, the very guest he himself had been mistaken for. Minutes after his code name had been revealed, a glass of brandy had been wafted under his nose, and the twelve of them, existing contestants and stranger alike, had enjoyed a quiet drink together by the roaring fire that dominated the south wall. It wasn't quite the evening the twenty-seven-year-old had had in mind when he left his parents' place earlier that day, but perhaps serendipity had presented an opportunity he'd never have seized under normal circumstances. Perhaps a murder mystery event designed to challenge the intellect of twelve strangers was precisely the kind of thing Richard Ike would enjoy, given half the chance. And so, it simply remained for him to acquaint himself with the rules of the game and the dispositions of the other guests. Chapter 2 White Admiral December 26th, 1989 Brian Gallagher, a warehouse operative from the Metropolitan Borough of Rotherham, Sheffield, was the first to arrive at Miller's Manor that bitter afternoon of December 26th, 1989. As a matter of fact, his was the only vehicle on the vast driveway as he stepped out into the cold. The engorged, crimson sun hovered ethereally above the horizon to the west, making way for the swollen snow clouds approaching from the east. Gallagher shivered perceptibly sensing a greater dusting of snow than was promised over the radio earlier that morning, on his drive from Fitzwilliam Road. Cautiously, he approached the manor, all the while making minor adjustments to the suffocating tie about his neck. The black suit he'd hired for the occasion was a touch too small for him, but he'd persisted with it on the basis of making a good impression, an impression crucial to his overall objective and that objective was to overcome, or at least to attempt to overcome, the crippling personal anxieties that had, he felt, led to his being a man of advancing years, living what his few friends would often describe as a pitiable life. He'd agonized over the decision to attend a murder mystery event at Miller's Manor for years, endlessly talking himself out of it at the last minute, or at the very least postponing the act of decision-making until tickets for the event were no longer available. But none of that mattered now, for there he was in his close-fitting suit, face to face with a grand entrance, ready to meet the challenges the event had in store for him. Gallagher had rapped on the door a number of times before taking the decision to try the handle. In doing so, he found that the door was unlocked, and proceeded to step inside. Met by the gargantuan hallway, a warm, brightly lit and truly festive interior, he closed the door behind him and listened for signs of activity. Hello, he called, in the familiar fashion of one evidently out of their comfort zone. No answer was forthcoming, but he was able to make out the spit and crackle of an open fire, coming from a room to his immediate left, and it was in that room, the reception hall, that Gallagher discovered the fireplace, and the signpost in the southwest corner, indicating that he had found what he was looking for, and that he hadn't accidentally stumbled into another house entirely, which his nervousness and general lack of confidence was often wont to suggest. On the west wall, by a large window of frosted glass, stood a table, upon which were laid a number of substantial crystal-cut glasses, and several decanters filled to the brim with what he suspected to be brandy or whisky. He counted twelve glasses, and, in his anxiousness, quickly poured himself a generous amount of whatever it was that teased him from the confines of one of the decanters. A quick sip confirmed his musings. Brandy. Further inspection of the room revealed a number of elegant tapestries, each of which bore coats of arms and crests unfamiliar to the warehouse operative, several portraits of dour-faced men in lordly garb, and a distinctive bureau on the north wall, host to an upturned top hat. 
Gallagher approached the bureau, the brandy sloshing back and forth in the glass, and discovered an envelope lying next to the top hat. On it was written, To whom it may concern. As the hulking forty-something collected the envelope from the bureau, an unfamiliar voice called to him from across the room. Hi there, came the greeting of the stranger, in a broad Lancastrian accent. Gallagher, startled, turned on his heel, and was met by the piercing gaze of a young woman, her tall, slender frame enchanting to him. Hi, he returned, his deep, uncouth tones echoing throughout the room. Were you the first to arrive? the girl continued. Gallagher hesitated, his anxiety forcing him to take a sip of the brandy in his hand. I think so, he finally blurted. I haven't seen anyone else. The young woman approached him, her eyes drawn to the envelope he was now holding to his chest in an unconscious, defensive manner. What have you got there? she quizzed. Instructions? Uh, Gallagher murmured, looking down at the envelope. Could be. The warehouse operative immediately handed the envelope to the stranger, compelled to do so by the sweet blue eyes that looked up at him. The girl willingly accepted it, and, without much ado, opened it. She read the contents aloud. Twelve strangers, twelve names. There was a moment of silence, as she turned the piece of paper over in quest of further directions. Is that it? Gallagher asked, his confidence boosted by his ever-increasing blood alcohol content. Seems so, the girl answered, her gaze turning to the top hat on the bureau. Is that where you found it? Gallagher nodded. The young woman approached the top hat and peered inside. Ah, she muttered, comprehension in her tone. What is it? Gallagher queried. We're supposed to draw names from it, she said, picking up the hat. What's wrong with our real names? The girl turned to face him, and as she did so, in walked a third arrival, a lady in her mid-thirties, well presented in a two-piece plaid suit. I was going to knock, she began, but the door was ajar, and I heard voices. Without hesitation, the girl holding the top hat said, We were about to draw names. Care to join us? Sure, the third arrival said, approaching the girl. Gallagher watched the exchange with some cynicism. When he'd applied to participate in the event, he'd read in the small print that, aside from the host, whose identity as the killer was supposed to be unknown, several of the twelve guests would be, necessarily, stooges. Stooges were employed to ensure that the basic rules were followed, and that, in some instances, the roles of initial murder victims were fulfilled. As the forty-something from Rotherham listened to the new arrivals, he felt sure the pair of them were actors, two stooges, or the host and the stooge setting the wheels of the game in motion. Their performance was fairly respectable, he thought. He might not have noticed if he'd been introduced to them as part of a larger group, but he'd be sure to keep a close eye on them, moving forward. "'I'll draw first, shall I?' the young girl announced, looking to Gallagher and then the third arrival for approval. Each nodded their agreement, and the girl plucked out a spherical scrap of paper before handing the top hat to Gallagher. He too fished out a suitable piece, then handed the hat to the lady in the plaid suit, who did likewise. Eyeballing Gallagher, the young girl said, You were the first to arrive. Go ahead. And so the warehouse operative unfurled his piece of paper, and read aloud the words printed there. White Admiral. The young girl followed suit, and read, Grey Dagger. The third arrival, a little nonplussed, read hers too. Longhorn. A heavy silence followed, interrupted only by the final sloshing of brandy, as Gallagher, now White Admiral, emptied his glass. The three contestants, who had been introduced by code name only, had each partaken in the consumption of brandy, Great Agger and Longhorn, a full glass behind White Admiral, and had paced up and down the length of the reception hall, making small talk, in anticipation of further arrivals. As twilight came and went, Three became seven, and as the grandfather clock in the southeast corner struck nine p.m., seven became eleven. With each new arrival, a name was plucked from the top hat on the bureau, establishing, in order of appearance, the following additions to the cast of characters. Andrina, a jovial middle-aged lady with a smile for everybody, her bright and colourful personality a remedy for the timid. Yellow Jacket, 
an attractive thirty-something lady who, as fate would have it, arrived in a bright yellow dress, and who, upon his arrival later that evening, would offer Richard Ike the top hat. Nightcrawler, a tall, dark-haired, bespectacled man in a beige sweater, who would later answer Ike's pounding at the door. Green Drake, a handsome, confident man, whose dynamic character and provocative dress shirt immediately earned him the favour of several fellow guests. Black Garden, a quiet, fair isle cardigan-wearing man who would later stand in the shadow of Nightcrawler, as Richard Ike was granted admittance to the event. New Forest, a blonde, diminutive lady with a quiet but pleasant demeanour, adorned that evening in a simple, olive-coloured floral dress, bespeaking the codename she had drawn. Scarlet Darter, a handsome, mustachioed Eastern European individual, whose brooding, shadowy persona was matched only by the Stygian darkness of the three-piece suit he wore. False Widow, a strikingly beautiful forty-something, her flowing black dress a sparkling spectacle to behold. And last but not least, the aforementioned Blue Bottle, a.k.a. Richard Ike, the unwitting participant in Murder at Miller's Manor. White Admiral had studied each new arrival with great interest. He was keen to pursue his theory with regards to Grey Dagger and Longhorn, the pair he had identified as potentially host and stooge. Would any of the other arrivals strike him as suspicious, or would his brandy fueled intoxication work against him in this respect? As they filed in, one by one, he did indeed find his drunkenness to be problematic in his attempts to size up his competition— but, if nothing else, the drink loosened his tongue. He was able to talk quite openly with his fellow guests, which went a long way in alleviating his apprehension, though his forced small talk wasn't likely to form the basis of a winning strategy in a game of who'd done it. So drunk was White Admiral, in fact, that, following the arrival of Blue Bottle a little after 9pm, he'd completely missed the moment the second envelope was delivered to the occupants of the reception hall. It was Scarlet Darter, the fellow with the moustache, that had noticed the item on the mantelpiece. He claimed not to have seen who it was that had left it there, but White Admiral, more than a little inebriated by this time, had his suspicions, though he was careful not to voice them. Instead, he chuckled to himself in the fashion of a madman, clinging dazedly to his umpteenth glass of brandy. You too, he thought to himself, as his glazed eyes bounced from Grey Dagger to Longhorn back and forth, I'm on to you. Meanwhile, Scarlet Darter had stepped into the middle of the room, and the other guests moved to surround him as he prepared to open the envelope. As had been the case with the first envelope, the same text was printed across the front of it. To whom it may concern. Eagerly, the mustachioed man opened the envelope, withdrew the card it contained, and read, in an accent tinged with Slavic flavours, Adjourn to the library. Where's that, exactly? was False Widow's immediate response, her long neck the object of White Admiral's furtive glances. Several blank expressions met her gaze, with the exception of Grey Dagger, White Admiral's stooge, who announced that she'd looked in on the library following her arrival earlier that afternoon. Let the game begin! This from Green Drake, the self-confessed life and soul of the party, who, on more than one occasion over the preceding hours, had announced his eagerness to get to it. And without further ado, the guests, twelve strong, left the warmth of the reception hall behind, and crossed the grand hall eastwards, in the direction of the library. At the back of the group, glass of brandy in hand, shuffled the drunken white admiral, his eyes never leaving Grey Dagger. He chuckled again, feeling mightily pleased with himself. "'I'm on to you,' he muttered. Chapter 3 Grey Dagger December 26th, 1989 The tall, slender girl who had been given the moniker Grey Dagger knew exactly where the library was, and not just because she'd looked in on it early that afternoon. She was, of course, a stooge. It wasn't the first time she'd played such a part. She'd played the role of Luna Solar three years running in the Summer Kill shows in Rillington the part of Andrea Butcher, the murderer's assistant in Buxton Manor's Halloween haunting of 85, not to mention the role of Rita Reel in Bakewell's spring blackout events, 87 to 88. 
but it was her part as the stooge with no name in Harry O'Grady's Miller Madness 86 that familiarized the young performer with Miller's manner and its extensive grounds. She had been thrilled to land a role in murder at Miller's manor. It was advertised as an exclusive event, in which only persons meeting specific criteria would be chosen to participate, and this applied to both stooges and contestants. The fee wasn't bad either, a cool thousand for twelve days' work. Being familiar with the place was just a bonus. Though she hadn't met physically with the event organizers, she discussed her part in some detail with a representative over the telephone, agreeing upon the basic terms of the contract and what would be required of her. She'd been a little peeved that she wouldn't be able to meet with the games master or host beforehand, but the agent had insisted that the organizer took their events very seriously, and that the anonymity of the host was of the greatest importance. Whether or not the host or killer would be playing the part of a guest or conducting their murderous business from the shadows, the girl remained in the dark. Even the identities of the other stooges would be withheld, which she felt was a little strange, given that stooges typically worked together to ensure events stayed on course. But all in all, the gig was a no-brainer for the young performer, and she had been eager to get the ball rolling. The library, located at the end of a vast corridor connected to the Grand Hall, was in itself a large, rectangular space over two levels, with no external windows. Its walls were covered entirely with floor-to-ceiling shelves, upon which abundant, anonymous-looking brass and leather-bound tomes reposed. A spiral staircase made of iron stood in the northwest corner, climbing to a narrow balcony overlooking the room below, providing access to further nameless volumes, the highest rows of which were obscured by long-abandoned cobwebs. In the middle of the space stood a substantial reading table. Upon it, open to its first page, was a large book in green hardcover, presumably the rule book or guidebook. Grey Dagger led the other contestants directly to it, a revealing act, but a necessary one. Surrounding the table, the guests gawped at the open book before them, and, as soon as he laid his eyes upon it, Green Drake, the enthusiastic man in the brightly coloured dress shirt, read aloud, the crimes of the hypothetical somebody. Those were the words printed on the left-hand page, or verso, of the book. The right-hand page, or recto, featured an illustration. Is that us? Scarlet Darter asked, twisting the end of his moustache between thumb and forefinger. Sure looks like it, Green Drake answered on behalf of the collective. The illustration was indeed a representation of twelve upright figures surrounding a table, in what was assuredly the library in which they were presently standing. The crudely sketched individuals were keenly focused on an item upon the table, which, just as the case was in the actual library, was a large open book. Huh, Longhorn muttered impassively. What does it mean? Grey Dagger asked, playing her part convincingly. Who knows? added New Forest, a blank expression filling her small face. The crimes of the hypothetical somebody whispered Nightcrawler, a delayed reiteration of Green Drake's initial vocalization of the words on the versa. "'Mean something to you?' Green Drake quizzed. Nightcrawler shook his head dismissively. Spurred on by something approaching enthusiasm, Black Garden, the reserved fellow in the Fair Isle cardigan, reached out and turned the page. Andrina, the jovial but most vertically challenged of the ensemble, asked from her position at the rear, "'What does it say?' A hesitant silence followed, broken finally by the latecomer, Blue Bottle. Here, let's have a look, he said, motioning to Black Garden for the book. Black Garden slid the book in his direction, and, if only to appease the ever pleasant Andrina, Blue Bottle began to read from the book aloud. Listen long and hear my song. We've met before, you and I, probably, passed each other on the street, exchanged glances. But you won't remember me. Nobody ever does. But you see, that's the beauty of it. I'm invisible. I can go anywhere, do anything. And the things I've done you wouldn't believe. Perhaps I'm plain, ordinary, you might say. Simply forgettable, like the washing of one's hands or the tying of one's shoelaces. Well, ordinary or not, forgettable or not, the twelve of you are here today and you're here to play my game. The game of the hypothetical somebody. The one who doesn't exist. 
the one who, by all intents and purposes, shouldn't exist. Blue Bottle paused. Is that it? Longhorn asked, in the same inexpressive manner. No, it goes on. But I know what you're thinking. The crimes. What about the crimes? Well, let me tell you about the crimes. There will be a number of fatalities here within the walls of Miller's Manor over the twelve days of Christmas. Deaths attributed to none other than me, the hypothetical somebody. I will stalk the halls and pick you off one by one, until only I remain. Unless, of course, one or several among you are clever enough to catch me in the act. Again, Blue Bottle paused to catch his breath, then continued. Who am I, I hear you asking? Am I a stranger to you all, even at this very moment watching from some hidden place, secreted away? Or am I standing beside you right now, the warmth of my body radiating next to yours? Blue Bottle took a moment to cast suspicious glances in the direction of his present company. Similar glances met his own, including that of Grey Dagger, the stooge, who, having listened to the words of the host, was struggling to understand just how the games master intended to falsify the deaths of a dozen guests in order to achieve his or her implied victory. Blue Bottle concluded, And so your objective should be clear, ladies and gentlemen. You've a killer to catch. But if you've any doubts as to my veracity, let me assure you that this is unequivocally a fair game. Catch the killer, and the killer will crown you victor. Blue Bottle turned the page, anticipating further notes and or instructions, but the rest of the book consisted of blank pages. Grey Dagger was the first to break the silence, addressing Blue Bottle. Wait, if you're only here to wait out the bad weather, then what happened to the twelfth guest? What? False Widow answered on Blue Bottle's behalf. The book mentions twelve guests, twelve people in the illustration, too. If Blue Bottle isn't supposed to be here, then what happened to the person who was? Oh, I see, False Widow acknowledged. Last-minute jitters? Change of heart? Not likely, Longhorn interjected. Oh, I wouldn't say that. White Admiral slurred, the alcohol on his breath, an unwelcome aroma to the guests in his immediate vicinity. Nerves can get to you. Nightcrawler, standing tall and casting suspicious eyes at Blue Bottle, said, Well, he says he's here to wait out the bad weather. Blue Bottle, quite calmly, held his hands up in the air and said, Whoa, whoa, hold it there. I'm not the games master, if that's what you're implying. Oh, right. Nightcrawler returned testily, and I guess we're supposed to just take your word for it. Grey Dagger, sensing an unwelcome change of tone, did what she had been hired to do, and steered the group back on course. Okay, lads, let's nip it in the bud, shall we? It's a little early in the game for accusations. We haven't even seen a murder yet. She's right, Longhorn agreed, placing her hands on the table. I, for one, am absolutely knackered. I think we should grab our luggage and find our rooms. Grey Dagger eyeballed Longhorn with something like familiarity. A fellow stooge, for sure. She'd had her suspicions earlier in the day with regards to the lady's role in the game, and now, with the talk of sleeping quarters, was absolutely certain that Longhorn's function was to ensure that the contestants were assigned rooms. And so, following some brief discussion regarding the open book and its unusual contents, the guests returned to the Grand Hall in order to collect their bags. The guest rooms were located on the first floor, each accessed via the gallery situated at the top of the stairs overlooking the Grand Hall. The act of finding one's room was as simple as locating his or her code name, affixed to one of twelve particular doors. As the other guests filed away, all with relative ease, apart from White Admiral, whose inebriation had made it almost impossible for him to read the code name on his door, Grey Dagger located her quarters, stepped inside, and locked the door behind her as per the instructions she had been given. Her task that evening was to play the role of victim number one. She'd initially balked at the idea of portraying a corpse, as her previous experiences had seen her in more active roles. But it wasn't so much the idea of playing dead that bothered her, it was the staying dead. Instructions had been provided as to where she would need to go following her demise, or in this case, disappearance, but— with the ever-increasing intensity of the snowstorm without, she suddenly started to doubt whether or not such an ambitious game was in fact feasible under such conditions. She made herself comfortable in the sizable room. 
Like all the guest rooms, it was a traditional suite, complete with king-size bed, eerie, watchful portraits, chic nightstands, freestanding mirror, and, of course, obligatory ensuite bathroom. The window on the north wall was supposed to overlook the manor's extensive grounds, including the grand water fountains and the walled garden, but, on the evening of December 26, 1989, the window was little more than a shield from the elements. Nothing could be seen beyond that single pane of glass, other than a dark mass of compacted snowflakes. Grey Dagger shuddered at the thought of being out there in the blizzard, naked before creation. But just then her thoughts returned to her present situation, and the thorny issue of her disappearance. The morning of the 27th, at precisely 7 a.m., the sleeping contestants woke to the sound of clock striking on the ground floor. Drowsy, and in the case of White Admiral, hung over, the guests dragged themselves from the warmth of their beds, slipped into the provided dressing gowns, and descended the stairs. There, in the grand hall, five grandfather clocks were chiming in perfect synchronization, their elegant facades draped with cheap tinsel. Upon reaching the grand hall, False Widow, who was always quick on her feet early in the morning, wasn't so much attracted to the sound of the striking clocks as she was to the smell of toast wafting from the dining room. She moved in the direction of the dining room, just north of the reception hall, and found that she wasn't the first to rise. Longhorn, her black hair tied up in a bun, was in the act of toasting bread. The toaster was on the west wall, alongside a number of food items laid out on a breakfast bar, including croissant, yogurt, fruit, and the like. "'Who put all this together?' False Widow asked. "'I did,' Longhorn replied casually. "'The kitchen is fully stocked. You knew that, right?' Hesitantly, False Widow nodded. She hadn't read any of the event literature beforehand. Green Drake appeared behind her moments later, wearing a similar befuddled expression. "'Who's serving breakfast?' he asked. False Widow said, "'Longhorn, apparently.' Over the ensuing fifteen minutes or so, the other contestants managed to find their way to the dining room, each of which, having asked the question of who it was that had prepared their food, had enjoyed a bite to eat with fresh tea and coffee. All, that is, with the exception of Grey Dagger. But there was nothing strange about that, quite to the contrary, especially as far as the enthusiastic Green Drake was concerned. The disappearance of Grey Dagger was a clear indicator that the game had begun. Swallowing his last mouthful of Earl Grey, the excitable man rushed off to his room to dress. And so, the eleven guests, sated following a continental breakfast courtesy of Longhorn, went in quest of Grey Dagger, beginning their search in the last place she'd been seen, her bedroom. But there was a degree of confusion when, upon inspection, a thorough search of the room at the northeasternmost end of the gallery yielded no evidence to suggest a murder had taken place. Even the bed was made, indicating the girl had risen, or perhaps implied that she hadn't actually made it to bed in the first place. Throughout their investigation into Grey Dagger's disappearance, White Admiral, whose banging head wasn't at all helpful in the search, continued to remind himself that she had been one of his two suspects, one of the women who had so roused his suspicions upon their arrival the day before. He felt, rather confidently, that if Grey Dagger had perished at the hand of the host on night one, that his other suspect, the lady known as Longhorn, was very likely to be the one responsible for her disappearance. And this, to his mind, was further substantiated by the fact that it was Longhorn who just so happened to be the one who prepared breakfast that morning. But he needed to be certain, and, unfortunately, his pounding head did little by way of providing clarity of mind. Noon came and went, but there was still no sign of Grey Dagger. In the minds of the investigating guests, the lack of evidence in her wake was a little disheartening. Many of them had expected more from murder at Miller's Manor. But then again, others among them believed the lack of evidence was a good thing. To give too much away too early was to put a premature end to what, after all, was a relatively expensive event. For those who had read the small print, the event had been billed as a self-catering affair, one in which food would be provided but under the proviso that the contestants cooked for themselves. As the day had advanced, with nothing coming to light regarding the missing guest, the kitchen, wherein fresh coffee, alcohol, and numerous foodstuffs were plentiful, became the logical place to loiter. As evening fell upon Miller's manor, 
The contestants adjourned to their rooms, each of them somewhat tired and deflated, having turned to alcohol as a more feasible means of passing the time. That is, ten of the eleven remaining contestants adjourned to their rooms. One of them never left the ground floor. Chapter 4 Longhorn December 28, 1989 the Invisible Dead. This, a comment made by the grinning Andrina in reference to the recently departed Grey Dagger, was the utterance that sent the excitable Green Drake dashing from the dining room in the direction of the library, following a half-eaten breakfast on the morning of the twenty-eighth. Bewildered, the other contestants followed in his wake. Even White Admiral, whose hangover-induced toast consumption was no longer a priority. Reaching the chilly library, the guests crowded around the reading table besides Green Drake, who, clutching a cigarette lighter, was in the act of lighting one of the many church candles that had been dotted throughout the Grand Hall. "'What are you doing?' quizzed White Admiral, still chewing his last mouthful of toast. "'The Invisible Dead,' Green Drake returned between heavy breaths. "'Don't you see?' And they did see. Talk of invisibility had inspired the man in the gaudy dress shirt to bring the book's blank pages into close proximity with a naked flame, in order to reveal, in invisible ink, anything that might be written there. And sure enough, a short sentence was dimly revealed on the first of the green book's blank pages. Excitably, Green Drake read the words aloud. The moth sleeps like the dead. A moment of tense silence followed permeated only by the sound of White Admiral's incessant chewing. "'The bed!' Green Drake suddenly shouted. "'We need to take a closer look at the bed!' "'Whose bed?' Scarlet Darter blurted. His question went unanswered. Once more the impulsive man took off at the speed of sound, out of the library, into the grand hall, and up the stairs, three at a time. And again the other contestants followed, some intrigued, some positively bemused. The guests in pursuit, Nightcrawler, White Admiral, Andrina, Scarlet Darter, False Widow, New Forest, Yellow Jacket, Blue Bottle, and Black Garden, located Green Drake in the empty quarters of the missing Grey Dagger. Standing by her bed, he was in the act of carefully pulling back the plump duvet. Beneath the covers, in the centre of the bed, in stark contrast to the white sheets, lay the slight and distinctive form of a preserved black beetle. "'Is it dead?' asked Yellow Jacket, wincing at the sight of the creature. "'Quite,' Green Drake said, prodding the insect. "'Wouldn't be much of a clue if it could just crawl away now, would it?' "'Clue?' mumbled Nightcrawler, a look of confusion filling his face. Green Drake turned to him. "'It's a beetle,' he said, matter-of-factly. "'So?' This from False Widow. "'A longhorn beetle,' Green Drake continued. "'A dead one at that.' Yellow Jacket gawped at the insect. "'If it's a clue about Longhorn,' she began, "'then what's it doing in Grey Dagger's bed?' "'In all likelihood,' New Forest offered, "'the pointer's in the direction of the next victim.' "'Yeah,' Green Drake agreed. "'A warning of sorts.' As he spoke, he turned to survey his present company in search of Longhorn, but the lady with the dark hair and round-rimmed glasses wasn't among them. "'Has anybody seen Longhorn?' he asked but the silent shrugs he received in return spoke louder than words. Just when exactly Longhorn had vanished, none of the remaining participants could attest, and it soon became clear that none of the participants had any recollections of seeing her that morning, and that none of them could remember even approximately when they'd last seen her. And so it was assumed that Longhorn was the second stooge, the second victim of the would-be killer, the killer who had promised, in writing, to pick them off one by one. But at the very least they had clues now, in the form of the invisible ink and the preserved beetle. Other clues would be forthcoming too, if, of course, they kept their wits about them. It was through a process of deduction that the ten remaining guests stumbled upon the third clue. White Admiral, the anxious drunk, recalled Longhorn excusing herself from the kitchen a little after six p.m. the previous evening, in order to, and he quoted, visit the little girl's room. Revealing to the rest of the contestants his suspicions regarding both her and Grey Dagger, he said he'd watched her leave the kitchen and 
walk not in the direction of the water closet next door, but along the corridor to the east, towards the library. It was just a glance, he said, but felt that her deception was very typical of a stooge's behaviour. I didn't dwell on it, he added. In fact, I think that was around the time we cracked open the port. Encouraged by White Admiral's recollections, the contestants, some of whom were quietly nursing unwelcome forebodings, had returned once again to the library, in search of evidence surrounding Longhorn's disappearance. Following Green Drake's subsequent attempts to reveal further hidden messages upon the blank pages of the guidebook, a general sweep of the lower level revealed nothing of note. New Forest, however, took it upon herself to climb the spiral staircase in the northwest corner, and, a couple of minutes after doing so, found herself addressing her counterparts below. Hey! she yelled. Up here! Moments later, the ten contestants of Murder at Miller's Manor were gazing at the spine of a dislodged book among the hundreds and hundreds filling the shelves along the west wall. The book was protected by a bright yellow dust jacket, though the dust jacket itself had evidently not been protected from whatever had caused the shiny crimson smears that peppered it. Is that blood? Andrina stammered, the usual warmth in her voice completely absent. It looks like blood. False Widow said, her curious hand extending unconsciously towards the soiled item. Wait, Nightcrawler blurted, producing a handkerchief. Allow me. With a handkerchief covering his hand, the tallest of the guests extracted the blood-stained volume from the shelf, and, followed by the other contestants, returned to the lower floor, in order to place it alongside the guidebook on the reading table. The ever-enthusiastic Green Drake shoved his way to the front of the group, and immediately began leafing through the tome, only to be frustrated when his quest for information yielded nothing but a series of blank pages. The candle flame revealed nothing in the form of invisible ink, either. The dust jacket, Yellow Jacket muttered to herself, as something seemingly very obvious dawned upon her. What? came the exasperated tones of Green Drake. The dust jacket, she repeated. It's yellow. And bloodstained. This from Scarlet Darter, who, in his deep contemplation, was again twisting the end of his moustache. Directing the question at nobody in particular, Yellow Jacket asked, Does that mean I'm next? White Admiral stepped forward. I don't know, he said. Are you a stooge? Yellow Jacket shook her head, but all present could see quite clearly that White Admiral wasn't convinced. And then it was Black Garden who stepped forward who, other than supplying the occasional yes or no to questions put to him, had been little more than a shadowy background character in the game thus far. Not likely, he said, in answer to White Admiral's question. I mean, we all drew names from a hat. Meaning? asked White Admiral, seeking clarification. But I watched Yellow Jacket draw her name from the hat. There was no trickery. And, as the man in the Fair Isle cardigan spoke, White Admiral's gaze returned to the attractive thirty-something, who, under the intensity of his mildly hungover glare, seemed to be retreating into an invisible realm of uncertainty. He saw genuine fear in her dark eyes, but, also, as he looked at her, he felt the familiar flutter of butterflies in the pit of his stomach, telling him something was wrong. But it was just a game, he reminded himself. The Stooges were simply actors— wasn't it probable, he considered, that from time to time stooges would employ basic sleight of hand in order to assure certain outcomes? That had assuredly been the case with Grey Dagger and Longhorn, who had been the first to draw their names from the top hat on the twenty-sixth. Yes, all very probable. White Admiral had a third suspect now, someone else to keep his eye on. Just where the other two had ended up he hadn't a clue, although he was reasonably sure, thanks to the storm, that they hadn't ventured beyond the walls of the mansion. And what a storm it was! The snow had been coming down in vast clouds for days, forming drifts along the exterior of the property, blotting out daylight on the ground floor. Contact with the outside world was completely out of the question. Miller's manor was without a telephone line, and the roads were unnavigable. Black Garden, who had apparently become rather protective of the suddenly timid Yellow Jacket, spoke up once again. If Yellow Jacket is the next victim, 
then we have a duty to keep an eye on her. Yes, Green Drake agreed, his face a mask of fervor. And in doing so, we might just have an opportunity to catch our mysterious killer in the act. Yellow Jacket said nothing whatsoever. She just eyeballed the other contestants, nine strangers in her midst, two others missing, and an invisible host, a killer lurking in the shadows. The attractive thirty-something shuddered. And then, darkness. Chapter 5 Yellow Jacket December 28, 1989 it had been an unwelcome power cut that had plunged the ten contestants into complete and total blackness. A planned event, most had assumed. But was it? The lights in the library were out for a good minute or so, which, in terms of time spent in the void, amounted to a very long period indeed. There was shouting and shuffling, fumbling and tumbling, and a great deal of bewilderment, as the blinded guests struggled to get their bearings. Even Green Drake's candle had been snuffed out, which made it, and the lighter lying beside it, impossible to locate in the darkness. When the lights flickered back on some seventy seconds later, there stood nine, where before had stood ten. But this wasn't immediately noticed by the squinting contestants. Each of them caught up in the act of collecting both themselves and the various items of furniture they'd unwittingly knocked to the ground during the blackout. Black Garden, the man who had been keeping a close eye on Yellow Jacket, was the first to notice she was no longer among them. "'Where is she?' he blurted, so concerned that he failed to refer to her by name. "'Who's missing?' False Widow asked, her gaze dancing from guest to guest. "'Yellow Jacket,' answered Green Drake, a note of disappointment in his voice. But White Admiral, the suspicious drunk, was having none of it. "'Stooch!' he coughed. "'She's gone the way of the other two now.' And you, he added, turning accusing eyes to Black Garden, you're a liar. Me? Black Garden returned. Care to elaborate? Yeah, it hit me like a ton of bricks when the lights came back on. You weren't there when Yellow Jacket drew her name from the hat. In fact, if memory serves, you rolled in after eight, an hour after she did. Damn! Andrina blurted, recalling Black Garden's arrival. How did I miss that? This from Green Drake, whose memory of December 26th wasn't quite as clear as he would have liked it to be. Tuts and scowls form the basis of the ensuing reactions. As with a shrug of his shoulders, Black Garden proffered, I must have watched New Forest or False Widow draw their name then. I'm pretty sure at least one of those two arrived after I did. Bullshit! Green Drake blurted. People! he continued enthusiastically, pointing at Black Garden. Allow me to present our first confirmed stooge. Wait a minute, Black Garden began, waving his hands about. I'm not a stooge. It's just that the lady in the yellow dress caught my eye, and, you know, we were all drinking, and somehow— He trailed off, discouraged by the sceptical eyes that met his. It's okay, Green Drake said reassuringly. It's just a game, after all. You'll just have to deal with the fact that we're all going to keep a close eye on you moving forward. And the man in the gaudy dress shirt laughed heartily. Busted, White Admiral scoffed, eyeballing the man in the fair isle cardigan. Black Garden just shrugged his shoulders dismissively. If he had a secret to hide, nothing in the look upon his pale face suggested as much. But still, the idea that a confirmed stooge could be in their midst, coupled with the sudden disappearance of Yellow Jacket, served to reinvigorate the game's participants. Scarlet Darter stepped forward. Back to the game at hand. Where do you suppose they're hiding? He asked, addressing the room at large. The Stooges? White Admiral ventured. Yeah, Scarlet Tartar confirmed. I mean, I know it's a game and all, but they've got to be here somewhere. Wouldn't stand much of a chance out there in the storm. Miller's Manor's a big place, New Forest offered. It's got to be full of hidden rooms and corridors. The library, for example, Green Drake added. It's exactly the kind of place you'd expect to find a secret door. A secret door through which a stooge might disappear during a power outage? This from White Admiral, keen to advance his agenda, whilst casting dubious glances at Black Garden. At last, Black Garden, over whom a veil of doubt had been thrown, announced that he intended to leave his present company 
in order to seek out clues regarding the disappearance of Yellow Jacket, and off he went, sniffing the air like a dog. New Forest, Green Drake, and White Admiral made a search of the library, repeatedly removing and replacing dozens of books in attempts to trigger some sort of hidden mechanism. Their efforts, though steadfast, yielded nothing whatsoever. Scarlet Data, Andrina, and False Widow committed themselves to a search of the ground floor, reception hall, dining room, kitchen, study, games room, and a couple of as of yet unvisited rooms, in quest of clues. Nothing was revealed. No one in the silent laundry room, no signs of movement in the extensive larder, and no evidence to suggest any recent trips to the shadowy cloakroom. Nightcrawler and Blue Bottle descended into the basement, a dark, labyrinthine system of tunnels and low-ceilinged rooms, host to long-forgotten furniture and never-to-be-recovered detritus. The dimly lit passageways were less than inviting, and, following a close encounter with the rumbling of the manor's gargantuan boiler, the pair retreated at speed, more than satisfied to dismiss the basement as a likely hideout for the missing guests. Black Garden's efforts were uninspiring, too. He wandered up and down the gallery on the first floor several times, paying visits to the rooms of Grey Dagger, Longhorn, Yellow Jacket, and his own, respectively, finding nothing of note in any of them, other than the previously discovered beetle in Grey Dagger's bed. He looked for hidden doors in the wooden panelling lining the gallery and its connecting corridors, but, much to his chagrin, he failed to locate any hollow-sounding sections hinting at concealed domains within. In the end, he abandoned his search and returned to the ground floor in order to reconvene with the other contestants. As the day progressed, the nine remaining guests came no closer to solving the mystery of Yellow Jacket's sudden disappearance. Black Garden had insisted that he wasn't a stooge, repeatedly citing the fact that he'd been attracted to the lady in the yellow dress, and that his memory of events as they transpired on the 26th were fuzzy as a result. Some chose to believe him. Others, particularly White Admiral and Green Drake, chose to keep a close eye on him. All, however, agreed that Yellow Jacket was a stooge. This substantiated by the facts that Black Garden hadn't, after all, watched her draw her name from the top hat, and the assumption that those going missing would have to be in on it. The nature of murder mystery events in general was a subject of much debate later that evening, when each of the guests, having individually had their fill of microwavable ready meals, gathered in the reception hall by the fireplace. Drinks were poured, and the fire was lit, Nightcrawler seeing to it that sizable flames were dancing, before helping himself to his share of the brandy. "'I've been to these things before, you know,' said False Widow, her striking features aglow in the firelight. They've always been highly organized, but this just feels so chaotic, it feels off somehow. I've been thinking the same thing, Scarlet Darter agreed. There's so little to go on, and with the storm raging out there, I, I'm beginning to feel more like a prisoner than a participant. Just look at it. He motioned to the large window on the west wall, dark with snow. We couldn't leave if we wanted to. White Admiral stepped forward, already a drink or two ahead of the others. "'Which in itself is odd,' he said. "'I mean, you'd think the organisers of this thing would be a little concerned about us being trapped up here, but not a bit of it. Things are plodding along regardless.' "'Fools and the foolish,' New Forest mumbled, mostly to herself. Green Drake caught it, though. "'What was that?' he asked, not understanding. "'Fools and the foolish, as in, despite our misgivings, we're playing the game anyway.' Blue Bottle tutted. I, for one, would rather not be playing the game, he announced, shaking his head. And then it was Andrina's turn to speak, her train of thought returning to the subject of stooges. How many stooges can there be, anyway? the middle aged lady asked. Three, four, five, more? How many of you here, right now, are in on it? Any one of us could be. We can't just point the finger at Black Garden. And the host, the killer, is that one of you, too? And as for the murders, are we to assume that when the killer catches us, we're simply told to go into hiding with the others? The other guests simply glared at Andrina, each of them silently considering her inquiries. There were no definite answers to provide her with, and, as evidenced by their taciturnity, if any of the present contestants were stooges, they were in no immediate rush to announce themselves as such. 
As for the host or killer, their methods and motivations were yet to be revealed, or, as per the rules of the game, discovered. And it was with that uncertainty in mind that the guests in the reception hall, Black Garden included, decided to stick together for the remainder of the evening, before retiring a little after 9 p.m. The following morning, having slept long and peacefully owing to the universal locking of bedroom doors, the guests once again gathered in the dining room to partake in the consumption of toast. The storm had subsided, but the huge, unconquerable snowdrifts remained. The quiet from without seeped into the manor. The contestants ate in complete silence, eyeballing one another cautiously, their suspicions, thanks to Andrina's questions the previous evening, no longer focused solely upon the man who wore the Fair Isle cardigan. After breakfast, they each went their separate ways, some choosing to read in the library, and others taking the opportunity to practice billiards and darts in the games room just south of the library. Noon came and went, and late afternoon was upon them, before anything of real significance occurred. The light was fading fast, when Blue Bottle, seeking the comfort of brandy in the reception hall, happened upon something truly remarkable. He called to the others, who, in their increasing boredom, were only too thrilled to come rushing to his side, in order to see what all the fuss was about. There, in front of the fireplace, which had been lit by persons unknown, lay a striking work of art, composed of what appeared to be thick brown hair. Long strands of the stuff had been tied together in thin clumps, forming the curves and lines of a large creature, sprawled out across the light oak floor. The flickering fire above animated the beast, the shadows it produced giving it substance, life. There was the suggestion of scales, vast beating wings, serpentine legs, sharp talons, a great head, an enormous snout, a forked tongue licking at the flames in the fireplace. "'What on earth is it?' asked an awed Andrina. "'It's a dragon,' whispered Green Drake. "'Is it made of—' "'Hair?' muttered False Widow. "'Sure looks like it,' said Nightcrawler. "'Human hair?' This again from the awed lips of Andrina. "'It looks like yellow jackets,' Black Garden observed. White Admiral hesitated, before adding, "'Wouldn't that be taking things a little too far?' "'How far is too far?' asked New Forest. "'This far,' answered Blue Bottle, motioning towards the display before him. A moment of silence followed, before Scarlet Darter broke it. "'It's me,' he announced. "'What?' Green Drake asked, turning to face him. The dragon, Scarlet Darter, I'm a dragonfly. We're all insects, arachnids and the like. He paused momentarily. Grey Dagger, remember the clue in the book? The moth sleeps like the dead, quoted New Forest. That's it, the Grey Dagger moth, confirmed Scarlet Darter. Longhorn, a beetle, yellow jacket, a wasp. But what does it mean? asked White Admiral who, even as he asked the question, was contemplating just what form of insect a white admiral might be. Scarlet Darter answered, It means, ladies and gentlemen, that there's more to this game than meets the eye. We should watch our backs. What are you implying? quizzed Andrina, her usual jovialness a million miles away. But nobody answered her. The nine contestants simply gazed at the shape of the dragon on the floor beneath them, its sharp tongue a sinister omen of what, presumably, was to follow. But just what might that be? Questions were eventually asked, mostly along the lines of whose hair it was that lay on the floor, and whether or not the artist was one of the missing, or one of the nine remaining guests. But, just as the case had been during their search of the property the previous day, absolutely nothing was forthcoming. It was suggested, on more than one occasion, that Scarlet Darter remain under constant supervision for the remainder of the day, but the mustachioed Eastern European insisted that his safety was his own responsibility. This, of course, led to further suspicion, particularly in the eyes of White Admiral, who thereafter began to consider the possibility that the handsome individual was Stooge Number 4. He was still keeping an eye on Black Garden, too— though he had made a conscious decision to label only victims or would-be victims as obvious stooges moving forward. Murder at Miller's Manor was proving to be, by all accounts, 
a murder mystery event like no other, one in which its participants were harboring misgivings and forebodings, doubts that the game they had all signed up for truly was, in fact, a game. And as they filed away that evening, some mildly inebriated, others just plain tired, many wondered if Scarlet Data would be there at the breakfast table the following morning. Chapter 6 Scarlet Data December 29th, 1989 The handsome Eastern European known to the other guests as Scarlet Data was in fact a man of Polish descent by the name of Art Czaklowski, a resident of the Lincolnshire town of Grantham. He wasn't a regular attendee of murder mystery events, but had participated in enough of them over the years to consider himself moderately experienced, and was eager to take on the challenge that murder at Miller's Manor had promised. And that challenge was one of endurance, one in which twelve strangers were to be pitted against a common enemy over the twelve days of Christmas, a scenario ill-suited to the faint of heart. But young Art felt himself to be up to the task, with his quick-witted demeanour, dashing good looks, well-manicured moustache, and enviable head of thick, jet-black hair. Yet, on the evening of December 29th, as Art stood in front of the mirror in his quarters, mildly intoxicated and extremely tired, he wondered whether or not he truly had what it took to go the distance, for it no longer felt like a game. And if the looks on the faces of the others were anything to go by, the sentiment was collectively shared. Art was puzzled by a great many things, the game's lack of structure and its general instability, the circumstances surrounding the strange and particularly in the case of Yellow Jacket, inexplicable disappearances of the would-be murder victims, and the dreadful sense of isolation, owing, due to the vast snowdrift surrounding the manor, to a lack of contact with the outside world. The man known as Scarlet Darter slipped under the cold bedsheets, and curled up into a ball for comfort. He contemplated the discovery in the reception hall, the likeness of a vast dragon stretched out before the fire its eager tongue licking at the dancing flames. The vision consumed his thoughts, and he felt the heat of those flames licking at his toes beneath the sheets. Closing his eyes, he wondered when the moment would come. The dragon by the fire was a promise, a commitment to his demise, and as he lay there, spooked by the thin, reedy whistling of wind beyond the window panes, his thoughts returned to the very real possibility— that murder at Miller's Manor was not the game he signed up for. Some hours later, in the dead of night, the wind that had so disturbed Scarlet Dart had dissipated entirely, to be replaced by fresh snowfall. The clouds above the expansive estate were pink and swollen, drifting high above the peaks without a care in the world. As the first flakes kissed the old slates of Miller's Manor, a figure, in one of the building's many rooms, crept across the floorboards, careful not to disturb those sleeping. Stairs were descended, and passages were negotiated, until the figure reached Scarlet Darter's quarters. Knowing the door was locked, the figure withdrew a special key, a skeleton key, and with great care and extraordinary suppleness, unlocked the door without so much as a click. The door was opened, and in the figure slipped, mindful of every potential sound, and of the location of every possible loose floorboard. Like a wraith, the figure shimmied across the room in the direction of the bed, stopping by the posts at its bottom end. And then the figure knelt down, dipped its head under the sheets, and slid under the covers, totally blind, drawn to the heat radiating from Scarlet Darter's body. A tune was hummed, barely a whisper, the dissonant notes of which made the hairs on the back of the man's body bristle. Out came a needle, and seconds later, into the flesh of the sleeping pole it sank. But this was just the beginning. The figure had much to do before dawn. The first thing Green Drake did on the morning of December 30th was knock at Scarlet Darter's bedroom door. When the first knock returned no answer, he knocked a second time, and a third, until his continuous knocking roused the other seven guests, each of whom knew, much to their horror, what the relentless knocking at Scarlet Darter's door implied. Is it locked? 
Bluebottle asked Green Drake. I don't know. I. And saying nothing else, Green Drake proceeded to turn the door handle, a look of surprise washing over his face when the door opened. He would have locked that, surely, Nightcrawler muttered. Evidently not, False Widow observed. Or, well, you know, Andrina added nervously. And the eight guests standing by the door to Scarlet Data's room did know. The Eastern European had become the fourth victim. But none of them were quite prepared for what was encountered when they entered his quarters. It was Blue Bottle who took the initiative to cross the threshold. Green Drake, who had been incredibly enthusiastic to begin with, had wilted upon realizing the door was unlocked. He, like the others, was beginning to believe that there was something very wrong with the game in which they were involved. Stepping into the Pole's quarters, there was nothing to see at first, just an empty room and a neatly made bed. But then, False Widow remembered what Green Drake had uncovered under Grey Dagger's sheets on the morning of the twenty-eighth, and, with Blue Bottle at her side, moved towards the covers and carefully pulled them back. As she did so, an involuntary gasp escaped her, followed by several more to her rear as the others moved towards the bed. It wasn't a body, or even the suggestion of a body that covered the bedsheet. It was another work of art, the image of a winged insect covering the entirety of the sheet, a fly, perhaps, carefully outlined in a dark, crimson liquid. A small head was host to impeccably detailed and noticeably large eyes, sitting above a clearly defined abdomen. Broad wings were attached to the body, into which a subtle, olive-green translucency had been worked, in stark contrast to the red. It was an impressive technical achievement. Is that blood? mumbled Andrina, mostly to herself. I certainly hope not, Blue Bottle said, his tone of voice full of uncertainty. Do you think Scarlet Data did this? False Widow asked of no one in particular, her eyes glued to the macabre creation on the bedsheet. Green Drake took the opportunity to respond with another question. Does it even matter? Where is he, anyway? asked Nightcrawler. Gone the way the other stooges, I reckon, White Admiral answered with conviction. Another stooge, really? Black Garden stated sceptically. Well, you know my thoughts on the matter, Andrina added, in reference to her own suspicions voiced the day before. As the exchange heated, Blue Bottle separated himself from the crowd, moving closer to the image on the bedsheet. I think it's a mayfly, he said, silencing the collective. Look at the wings, he added, pointing at the translucent appendages. They're green. Green Drake, voiced the man of the same name. Could be, Blue Bottle stated. Green Drake swallowed audibly, turning his back to the grisly image. Andrina approached him, a wistful expression on her face. It's okay, she said. We're going to stick together. And then, turning to address the other seven guests, we're all going to stick together. Do you hear me? Until we figure out what the hell is going on here, we're just going to pile into the reception hall downstairs and keep an eye on one another. And, just like that, Andrina adopted the role of captain. Perhaps she felt herself to be bolder, wiser than the others. Whatever the case, the looks on the faces of the other contestants as she spoke were ones of compliance, and, eagerly, the group filed out of Scarlet Data's room and proceeded directly to the reception hall, heedless of their apparel, which, due to the rudeness of their awakening, consisted chiefly of dressing gowns and pajamas. As the day progressed, despite the occasional visit to the bathroom or to the kitchen in order to prepare foodstuffs in groups of two or three, the eight remaining guests, Nightcrawler, Green Drake, White Admiral, Andrina, False Widow, New Forest, Blue Bottle, and Black Garden, remained in the reception hall. The dramatic dragon made of human hair was swept away, and the fire was once again lit. Drinks were poured too, but Andrina insisted that a limit be placed on alcohol consumption, due to what she felt was increasingly likely to be a threat from an unknown source. As the daylight began to wane, it was decided that several mattresses be brought down from the guest quarters, in order for all present to spend the night together in the same room. Green Drake, fearing his demise, in whatever form it might take, had barely touched the food he had been brought, 
opting instead to down as many shots of brandy Andrina was willing to permit. He was terribly afraid, and his fears were shared by the group at large, who, suitably concerned as to the fates of the four missing contestants, were unwilling to allow a fifth to disappear. Night fell, and the large doors to the reception hall were locked. A rotating vigil was arranged, in which, at any one time, two designated guests were required to watch over the others for a period, thus allowing for some uninterrupted sleep. And, as fate would have it, the eight of them made it through till dawn without so much as the disturbance of a bump in the night. On the morning of the thirty-first, New Year's Eve, the remaining contestants awoke refreshed, and with a newfound sense of perspective. A lengthy conversation followed, in which the nature of Murdred Miller's manner was discussed, and it was generally agreed that perhaps the eight of them had overreacted, that Scarlet Darter was more than likely a stooge, just like the other three victims before him, and that the game, though strange and ambiguous in a way none of them had anticipated, was just that, a game, one that happened to be taking place during one of the worst storms ever to hit the region. It was also agreed that the host, whoever it was, and wherever they were, was making the best of a bad situation by continuing in spite of the weather. After all, each of them had paid quite the sum to participate. All that is, with the exception of Blue Bottle, who had, of course, stumbled upon the event by accident. And so, the mattresses were returned to the bedrooms, the guests showered and changed, and all eight reconvened in the kitchen, in order to prepare a sizable and much-deserved breakfast. It was New Year's Eve. Why not begin as they meant to go on? And, perhaps, with their heads firmly back on their shoulders, they might, by exercising some shrewdness, discover some new clues. With a bit of luck, they might even be able to catch the killer in the act, before the killer fulfilled their promise to Green Drake. In their search for new clues, Blue Bottle had suggested the possibility that an outhouse he'd spotted through his bedroom window might be the place in which the missing guests were hiding, and if not, at the very least, the building might provide access to a means of escape in the event of an emergency. He was thinking specifically of skis and snow buggies, while simultaneously realizing the likelihood of finding either was slim. But, intrigued by his suggestion, Nightcrawler and Black Garden assisted Blue Bottle in his efforts to open the kitchen door, and burrowed through the massive snowdrift that had, up until that point, prevented them from leaving the building. The three men trudged through the masses of white stuff as best they could without crampons or other footwear suited to snow, and made it some fifty feet or so across the difficult terrain to the outhouse in question. The building was a time-worn structure, evidently a barn or similar, with no visible windows on the exterior, and a single point of entry via a huge sliding door, which was, unfortunately, padlocked. Without the means by which to force the lock, and due to the chill creeping along their spines with every second they lingered there in the afternoon gale, the trio were forced to abandon their investigation of the outhouse. If the four stooges were secreted away in there, in secret they would remain, for the time being at least. Upon returning to the manor, the three men were surprised to find that the other five contestants were waiting for them by the kitchen door. At the head of the group stood Andrina, their new captain, holding out a piece of paper. "'What is it?' Bluebot asked, still shivering. "'It was waiting for us in the library,' Andrina said. "'It's an invitation to dinner.' "'An invitation? From whom?' Nightcrawler asked, puzzled. "'The host,' Andrina answered. "'Look!' and she handed him the piece of paper. Nightcrawler read the note, then handed it to Black Garden, who did the same, and in turn handed it to Blue Bottle. Blue Bottle read the invitation aloud. Dear friends, you're cordially invited to dinner, 6 p.m. sharp. You know where to go. Be there. Yours, the hypothetical somebody. Blue Bottle eyeballed his present company. He was searching for a clue— a clue he knew would only be found in the eyes of the person responsible for the penning of the note, if that person was in fact one of them, as opposed to some as of yet unknown individual stalking them from the shadows, or, as the case may be, one of the missing contestants. Poker faces gazed back at him, each the same, and for a transitory moment he felt that each and every last one of them was the hypothetical somebody. 
all of them in on it, all of them out to get him. But, being a man of practical considerations, he said simply, Well, we'd better get ready then, hadn't we? And with those words, Blue Bottle left his present company and went in search of something to change into. As had been the case for several days now, due to the fact he'd only packed enough clothes for a day or two with his parents, he was well aware that the outcome of his search would yield one of two things— a Christmas jumper, or a Christmas jumper. Over the preceding hours, the eight remaining contestants prepared for dinner. Some were excited, namely False Widow and Green Drake, both of whom had a tendency towards the dramatic, and thoroughly enjoyed any excuse to get done up. Andrina and Black Garden were a little less enthused, each concerned that the game was once again moving in a peculiar direction, reintroducing feelings of doubt and mistrust. The other four, though, Blue Bottle, New Forest, White Admiral, and Nightcrawler, changed with a passive neutrality, refusing to commit to any kind of expectation. They would simply attend dinner as requested, and play the rest by ear. As the clock approached 6 p.m., the guests left their quarters and headed in the direction of the dining room. Arriving promptly at six, the contestants were surprised to discover that the table had been set, and that it had been set for nine people. Closer inspection revealed name cards on the table, with Nightcrawler, Green Drake, White Admiral, and Andrina assigned side by side along the east side of the table, and False Widow, New Forest, Blue Bottle, and Black Garden assigned to seats along the west side. But, oddly, though an additional place had been set at the head of the table to the north, it lacked a name card. Was the killer to be revealed at last? Bowl sat on placemats in front of the name cards, filled with what appeared to be a cold soup. Sitting as per their designations, the contestants noted that the soup was in fact gazpacho, as per the starter element as detailed on the large menu that had been placed in the middle of the table. Peculiarly, the main and dessert elements of the menu were entirely blank, and it isn't surprising that the notion of the Last Supper passed through the minds of some of the guests. A bowl, too, awaited whomever intended to sit at the head of the table, but there was nothing to indicate that they would be joined by another diner any time soon. No approaching footsteps, no obvious clues whatsoever. It was all very strange. The atmosphere was thick with uncertainty, and heavy with the suggestion of the beginning of a crescendo. Green Drake picked up a spoon and took a sip of his soup. What he tasted seemed to please him. Looking to the others, he said, Am I going to be the only one eating? And with those words, the others followed in kind, all with the exception of Andrina and Black Garden, who were still concerned as to just what it was they had been invited to. It's not exactly the New Year's Eve I had in mind, voiced Blue Bottle. What did you have in mind? asked Andrina. A quiet night in front of the telly. Sounds thrilling, muttered False Widow, sipping her soup enthusiastically. Beats this, Blue Bottle returned. Really, you don't even know what this is, mumbled Black Garden, still wincing at the thought of tasting his gazpacho. It's a poor excuse for a game, is what it is, Blue Bottle argued. Come on now, we could have quite easily turned you away, Nightcrawler blurted. And I'm thankful you didn't, but you've got to admit, this whole business is just... It's just weird. Weird, yes, but... That's what most of us signed up for, Nightcrawler continued. Looks like you're enjoying your soup, though. I wouldn't say I'm enjoying it, exactly. Look at Green Drake there. Nightcrawler gestured towards the man in his best gaudy dress shirt. He can't get enough of it. And it was just as Nightcrawler made his observation that Green Drake dropped his spoon and turned to face him. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. In fact, Nothing came out. Nothing at all. The colour ran out of his face, and as it did so, his hands automatically shot to his throat, clutching it, as though attempting to strangle himself, to force his throat to open up, anything to allow him to breathe again. He pushed his chair back and stumbled to his feet, his arms flailing about in a blind attempt to seek assistance from the air about him. Blue Bottle rushed to his aid, quickly followed by False Widow, each of whom began patting him on the back ineffectually, only too well aware of how little they were capable of helping him. 
What do we do? What do we do? False widow wailed repeatedly. I don't know. I, I don't know. Blue Bottle yelled in reply. Somebody must know something, Andrina screamed. Basic first aid, a Heimlich maneuver, anything. But he hasn't eaten anything solid. There's nothing in the soup to choke on, New Forest added. Green Drake collapsed by the table, his arms and legs still waving and whirling above and below him, his higher functions having taken a back seat, the battle for air diminishing his capacity to act rationally. The other contestants, powerless to help him, simply watched as Green Drake ebbed away before them. White Admiral sobbed, Nightcrawler bawled, Black Garden slumped back in his chair in a daze. The others jumped up and down in a blind panic like wild birds in a cage. Seconds later, Green Drake stopped breathing and lay as still as the ground upon which he had toppled. Seven pairs of eyes gazed at his lifeless body. Chapter 7 Green Drake December 31st, 1989 the man in the extravagant dress shirt dubbed Green Drake had been a murder mystery event regular. Up and down the country, he would often be found putting his analytical skills to good use in all manner of settings. From the Cluedo inspired events hosted every Halloween at the Pumpkin House in the heart of Lancashire's West Pennines, to the bi monthly coastal murder mysteries of Norfolk, presented by the murdering minds of Munsley. He even held a number of awards a dozen plastic television toppers, and was generally known to those who moved in the same circles as a shrewd, competitive, and comically uncompromising would-be gumshoe. Lying there on the cold wooden floor of the dining room at Miller's Manor, his cold face awash with a dreadful cocktail of frozen emotions, his closest acquaintances might have gone so far as to say that his death would have been a lesser concern to him than his inability to solve the mystery. Ever the enthusiast was the man whose real name had been Carkit Lee. But his present company, who had barely got to know him in the short time they'd spent together, were very concerned with the nature of his passing. What? What happened? asked Andrina timidly, her brief role as captain forgotten. He choked to death, that's what happened, White Admiral answered, still sobbing. But it's. it's just soup. "'Pure liquid. N nothing to choke on,' Andrina continued, her cheeks marred by tear-smeared eyeliner. "'Right,' Blue Bottle agreed, his breathing heavy and laboured. "'It looked like a reaction to something. An allergic reaction, perhaps.' "'Nah,' Nightcrawler blurted, with undue confidence. "'A man with allergies would have been more cautious.' New Forest shook her head. "'Know that for sure, do you?' she asked. "'It's a safe assumption, I reckon.' "'Fools and the foolish,' New Forest muttered, looking from Nightcrawler to the lifeless body of Green Drake on the floor. "'Whoa, whoa, wait a minute,' Black Garden chipped in, his hard eyes targeting New Forest. "'If we're so foolish,' he continued cynically, "'why don't you tell us what you think happened to the man?' "'How should I know?' she said with a shrug of her shoulders. "'All I'm saying is that it's foolish to presume to know.' "'Okay, okay, time out,' Blue Bottle inserted, waving his hands in front of his face. The man is dead. End of story, he continued, gesturing towards the body on the floor. There's some serious shit going on here, and until we've figured out what that is, we need to keep it together. Easier said than done, False Widow muttered. I mean, what if he was poisoned? What if the others, the missing, she added, emphasizing the word, were really murdered? Come on, no, White Admiral muttered. Don't bring the stooges into it. Green Drake here just suffered an allergic reaction, just like Blue Bottle said. Hesitantly, Blue Bottle nodded, in an effort to reassure False Widow. But her attention returned to the prostrate form of Green Drake on the floor, his face puffy and blue, his bloodshot eyes forever fixed in a ghastly, searching gaze. A lengthy silence followed. Black Garden eventually broke it. The truth of the matter is, he began, we have no way of knowing what happened to him. We haven't a doctor among us, and we're unable to leave this place until the roads are clear. We have no means of contacting the outside world, and— 
He stopped mid-sentence, a look of dawning realization filling his face. The soup, he said suddenly. How many of you tasted it? The other contestants confirmed that they'd all sampled the gazpacho, even Andrina, who, initially, along with Black Garden, had been reluctant to do so. You don't think— Andrina started, only to be interrupted by Black Garden. No, no. Listen, it all makes sense now and Black Garden proceeded to outline his revelation. It had occurred to him, quite abruptly, that, despite the fact that Green Drake had died at the dinner table, the host, or hosts, whoever they were, hadn't intervened. But, despite the advent of a genuine emergency, nobody, in on it, as it were, had chosen to reveal themselves. Which could mean only one thing, that the death of the man in the flashy shirt was planned. It was murder. And we should have known, Black Garden continued, eyeballing Blue Bottle. You identified the Mayfly on Scarlet Darter's bed. It was another warning. You're right, New Forest agreed. Every time someone's disappeared, a clue's been left behind in their wake. And every time, False Widow put in, the focus of the clue has later disappeared, or was murdered, Nightcrawler surmised. White Admiral, who saw himself as the skeptic of the group, kept quiet on the matter. He was much too disturbed by Green Drake's passing to contribute to these escalating suspicions. "'What do we do now?' Bluebottle asked of nobody in particular, and nobody answered. A minute passed. It lasted an eternity. Snapping the contestants out of their reveries, Bluebottle spoke again. "'This is going to sound a little macabre, but I think we should put the body outside.' on ice, so to speak. It's cold enough that he'll be preserved out there, which, as I'm sure we all know, is important if a crime has been committed. Several blank faces met his suggestion. Andrina grimaced. But Black Garden, who was growing increasingly assertive, offered to assist Blue Bottle with the moving of the body. And moments later, the two men were carrying the lifeless body of Green Drake out of the dining room and into the kitchen. From there, the pair trudged along the path carved earlier in the day by Blue Bottle and Nightcrawler, and placed the body some seven or eight paces along it, to the side of the path in deep snow. The wind was blowing again, and above, the swollen clouds were once more threatening to unleash another flurry of snow. Grisly task performed, the shivering pair returned to the warmth of the manor, and reunited with the other contestants in the dining room. The atmosphere in that stuffy space was tense. The remaining seven guests studied one another with suspicious eyes, trust a fleeting thing. There was a real killer among them. Of that they were certain. The host was clever, calculating. This individual, whoever it was, had planned murder at Miller's Manor meticulously, so much so that he or she was able to move among the guests in a near-invisible capacity and it was due to this shadow-like quality that none of the contestants there at the dinner table could even surmise as to the host's identity. Was the killer at large in the depths of the house, or right there among them in the dining room? There had been twelve, and now there were seven. Four were missing, and one was dead. White Admiral, having reflected somewhat on the present situation, spoke up. It just occurred to me that if clues are left behind following the disappearance or death of a contestant or whatever, then shouldn't there be a clue in Green Drake's death? Five of us haven't left the room since it happened, New Forest said. Nobody's had the chance to leave anything behind. Granted, Blue Bottle put in, but what if the clue was in the death itself? I'm not sure I follow, New Forest confessed. As in, the way he died, Blue Bottle clarified. An allergic reaction? White Admiral speculated. Yeah, or poisoning, Blue Bottle said, looking at False Widow. Frowning, she asked, Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, New Forest acknowledged, following Blue Bottle's line of thought. What? False Widow insisted. You know what a False Widow is, don't you? Blue Bottle continued. False Widow nodded. A spider, of course. If my code name had been Black Widow, I might have been concerned. She's right, New Forest added. 
False widows are only mildly venomous. That said, it could still be a clue. The lady named after a spider backed up against the wall. So, what? What do we do now? She stammered. We grab what we can from the kitchen, Black Garden began, and hole up in one of the bedrooms upstairs, a nice small space where we can all keep an eye on one another, just like we did in the reception hall the other night. Nothing weird happened that night. The other contestants assented, too shocked and fatigued to argue with what, after all, seemed like a completely logical suggestion. Then tomorrow, at first light, the man who had worn his fair isle cardigan to dinner continued, we're going to have to see about getting out of here on foot. I, for one, do not intend to stay here any longer than is necessary. Again, the others agreed, paying little heed to the howling wind that, by the second, was increasing in ferocity. Half an hour later, the remaining seven contestants were locked in Black Garden's room at the northwest end of the gallery. Again, a two-man vigil was arranged, and, to offset the unnerving stillness and the oppressive suspicions, drinks were passed around, in addition to light snacks, including crisps and rich tea biscuits. And there they settled for the remainder of the evening, quietly eating and silently drinking, all the while haunted by the return of the storm outside. Every last one of them thought of Green Drake, their deceased counterpart, out there in the night, at the mercy of the blizzard. Visions of his red velvet shirt flapping like a flag on the snowscape filled their minds. Some even considered the possibility that he wasn't really dead, particularly White Admiral, whose train of thought ran something like this. Just another stooge. Climbed to his feet the second they dropped him in the snow. He's with the others right now, scheming, probably roaming the corridors, climbing the stairs, sh sh shuffling towards the door and he looked towards the bedroom door, trembling, his apprehension returning with a vengeance. He downed a glass of brandy, lay back on the makeshift bed he'd assembled on the floor, and closed his eyes, doing everything in his power to push the vision of the dead man to the back of his mind. Just before he drifted off, one final thought crossed his mind, one that troubled him deeply. Somehow he felt that it wasn't a threat from without that he needed to be concerned with. The threat was within, right there, in Black Garden's bedroom. He hoped it wasn't so. Chapter 8 False Widow January 1st, 1990 to the seven overwrought contestants who awoke on the morning of Monday, January 1st, 1990, in the quarters assigned to the fair Isle cardigan-wearing man known as Black Garden, the twelve days of Christmas, and the notion of a new year, couldn't be further from their thoughts. They were tired, each of them having missed out on quality sleep due to the need to cycle what they each felt was an essential vigil. But it had been a double-edged sword. The participants in murder at Miller's Manor were all well aware that sleep would have been impossible without the vigil, for there was a killer in their midst, a real killer, not some ethereal phantom operating from the shadows, a living, breathing human being, composed of flesh and blood, and quite possibly one of them. False Widow was the first to open her eyes that morning. She had slept in the dress she had worn for dinner, a black polka dot affair, and felt, there in the humidity of the crowded bedroom, somewhat exposed. She was a lavish lady, lived life to its fullest. She took every opportunity to socialize, whether the destination was a seedy nightclub on the outskirts of her hometown, Derby, in which inebriated youngsters would grope her in the dark, or the more civilized kind of night out involving fine dining at the Hidden Cat, with co-workers from the council. Stepping over the myriad limbs crisscrossing the carpeted floor, she flung herself into the ensuite, locked the door behind her, and experienced, for the first time in many hours, some semblance of privacy. She emptied her bladder, splashed cold water across her mug, and eyeballed her morning face in the mirror. Despite the lack of sleep and the trepidation coursing through her veins, she looked good, her skin was supple, and lines were few. There was a grace about her. But still, 
there was little she could do in terms of properly refreshing herself there in Black Garden's bathroom. And so, once more, she skipped across the bodies in the bedroom, some of which were now coming around, and left the crowded quarters. Entering her own room, which was next door, south along the gallery, she locked herself inside and ran herself a cold shower. Cold water had always held a revitalizing quality for the woman codenamed False Widow, whose real name was Maria Winter Botham. There, under the icy stream, she collected her thoughts, considering the very recent death of her fellow contestant, the erstwhile Green Drake, the man who wore the flashy shirts. She considered the fact that she hadn't even known the man's name, didn't know any of their names, and yet she'd watched him die, the stranger she'd spent so much time with over the preceding days. Maria wasn't a hard lady, but still she'd been surprised at how calm she'd remained, following Green Drake's passing, how, in light of all that his death had revealed about the game in which she was now a reluctant participant, she'd managed to keep a level head, whereas in other situations in her life, particularly those involving violent men and unpredictable women, she'd collapsed under the weight of her insecurities. The shower was her haven, her reset switch. Under the cool spray, she was invincible, untouchable, no self-respecting murderer would want to go anywhere near that freezing water. But her appointment with the cubicle couldn't last forever. If Blue Bottle's theory of Green Drake's death by poisoning was anything to go by, then, quite possibly, as was implied, she, the false widow, venomous or not, was the next target. What's with the code names anyway? she mused. Grey Dagger, the moth. Longhorn, the beetle. Yellow Jacket, the wasp. Scarlet Darter, the Dragonfly, Green Drake, the Mayfly. What about the others? What did Nightcrawler represent? New Forest, Black Garden, White Admiral, Andrina? To her mind, only Blue Bottle jumped out to her as somewhat obvious. After ten minutes or so in the shower, her skin had pruned. It was time to get out. She'd dry her hair, change into something comfortable, and join the rest of the contestants downstairs. But unfortunately for the forty-something from Derby, her plans would never come to fruition. Stepping out of the ensuite into the bedroom proper, somebody was waiting for her. She heard the muted notes of a hummed melody first, the drone of something terrible, something rapturously atonal. And then, quite suddenly, a clear plastic bag was thrown over her head and pulled tight. As she puffed and wheezed, seeking oxygen, the towel she'd wrapped around her body fell to the ground. Naked, she struggled with her assailant, fought back valiantly, but her assassin had the advantage. Consciousness fleeting, she caught sight of a familiar face in the freestanding mirror. She knew her killer, but, unfortunately, she also knew that she'd never get the opportunity to share the discovery in the short time she had left to live. Blue Bottle's prediction had been absolutely on the money. Green Drake's death, however vague, had implicated False Widow. But her death by suffocation was just the beginning of the murderer's work that morning. It was around eleven a.m. that the remaining six contestants came together again in the kitchen. Andrina, New Forest, and White Admiral had been late to the party, each of them having braved time alone in their quarters to recuperate. And when, a little after eleven-fifteen, White Admiral, the last to arrive, walked into the kitchen to partake in the consumption of breakfast cereals, it was collectively understood that False Widow, the first to leave Black Garden's quarters that morning, wouldn't be joining them. Together, the six of them, Nightcrawler, White Admiral, Andrina, New Forest, Blue Bottle, and Black Garden, ascended the stairs once again, and approached False Widow's bedroom door. Black Garden knocked. "'Are you in there?' he called. There was no reply. He knocked again. "'Hello?' he ventured. But still, there was no reply. A tremendous sensation of déjà vu washed over the company like a Mexican wave, as, just as Green Drake had done two days earlier, Black Garden reached out and turned the door handle. It was unlocked. Pushing the door open, the contestants, one by one, crossed the threshold 
and stepped into a truly nightmarish scene. False widow, the strikingly beautiful forty-something, lay in two pieces on the carpeted floor. Her naked body had been severed at the waist with a pair of garden shears, the offending item carefully propped up against the nearby wall. Blood still trickled from the injury, pooling above and around both the torso and the severed legs. The bag that had been used to suffocate her still covered her face. Both Nightcrawler and New Forest promptly vomited, each of them dropping to the ground like stones. Andrina simply gawped at the spectacle, unable to stop herself from doing so. White Admiral ran out onto the gallery, where he proceeded to slam his fists upon the banister rail, while Blue Bottle and Black Garden, who had both stood at the head of the party, recoiled noiselessly. An agonizing silence ensued. New Forest was the first to notice a number of discarded refuse sacks near the door to the room, sacks that had evidently been fashioned by the killer into grisly garments, worn in order to avoid coming into direct contact with the blood of the victim. Both she and Nightcrawler retreated, taking the shell-shocked Andrina by the arm as they did so, and joined White Admiral on the gallery. But Blue Bottle and Black Garden were eager to learn everything they could from the site, despite a lack of forensic training and or knowledge of crime scene investigation. Unemotionally, they handled the garden shears, studied the shape and size of the sack garments, viewed the mutilated body from several perspectives, and surmised as to the condition of various items of furniture, namely a chaise long and a set of drawers, each of which had evidently been toppled in a struggle. Their efforts were born of the desire to know one thing. What did the death of False Widow imply? To whom did her death point? The six contestants reunited in the games room later that afternoon, following many an hour of blind wandering and stony silence. Inevitably, a discussion on the subject of False Widow's passing arose. If I'm honest, New Forest began, her voice a quiver. I much preferred the clues in the form of dried-up beetles and blood-stained books. Just what the hell is going on here? Blue Bottle blurted, bypassing New Forest's comment. If you're in on this, any of you, you need to speak up now. We all know things have gone too far. Nobody will hold you accountable. Just do the right thing and speak up. Now! White Admiral, who had downed half a bottle of rum, stepped forward. Not gonna happen, mate, he mumbled. The thing's fucked. It's all fucked. You, me, you lot, he added, indicating the group at large. We're all fucked. Why don't you just shut up, you coward? This from Black Garden. In response to his outburst, White Admiral simply proceeded to glug from the bottle in his hand. "'Come on now,' said Nightcrawler, the only one among them who appeared to be keeping his cool, despite his initial reaction to the discovery of False Widow's body. "'There's somebody else in the house. I know it. I do not believe for a second that any of you guys are involved. I mean, when on earth would any of you have the time to do—to do—' He hesitated. "'What was done to her?' Somebody had the time, Blue Bottle accused, his eyes scanning all the faces in his immediate vicinity, including Andrina, whose frown was pushing the facial muscles responsible for the expression to the limit. But the argument was short-lived. One by one, the devastated contestants filed out of the games room, until only White Admiral remained, who had fallen into a horizontal, alcohol-induced stupor on the room's large Chesterfield. If the severing of False Widow's body was a clue of some description, it went unresolved by the remaining guests at large, who, completely isolated from one another, were assessing the conditions outside as twilight fell upon the estate. The snow was coming down again, transforming the property and the surrounding landscape into little more than a life-size snow globe, its contents having been zealously shaken by a mollycoddled child on Christmas Day. And there, trapped in the bubble, roamed the unwitting contestants, tired and terrified, in the shadow of a demented killer. On the morning of the second, just after eight a.m., White Admiral awoke in the games room, nursing a headache the size of a mountain. He wandered into the connecting corridor opposite the library, and, sluggishly, his vision hazy, 
made his way into the grand hall in quest of the water closet by the kitchen, but his journey was interrupted. In the center of the grand hall, between the stairs and the ornate Christmas tree, something lay on the floor. White Admiral squinted, his early morning dazedness denying him clarity of vision. He blinked several times, but still the object was difficult to perceive. He saw a number of items piled together, some small, some large, some round, some oblong. To his watery eyes, the shapes, individually, looked exactly like the balloon animals his father had so often crafted for him as a boy. But he saw that the balloons were twisted together in the shape of a man. And, as he moved within striking distance of the inflatable figure, he soon realized that what he had mistaken for balloons were in fact the various elements of anatomy that made up a real man, and this poor individual had evidently suffered a violent reaction of some kind, but not the kind of reaction the likes of which Green Drake had suffered. No, this man was swollen to bursting point. It wasn't at all surprising that White Admiral had mistaken the man's bloated appendages for simple balloons. He let out an almighty scream, and, from various parts of the manor, the other contestants emerged, each of whom shared in White Admiral's horror as their gazes fell upon the bulging, purple form of Nightcrawler. "'What? What the hell happened to him?' cried Andrina, tearing at her hair with both hands. And then her eyes were drawn to a small object by Nightcrawler's side. It was a hypodermic needle. Chapter 9. Nightcrawler. January 2nd, 1990. A figure, the very same figure that had stalked the halls of Miller's Manor several nights before, emerged from the quiet of the library a little after three in the morning. The scattering of contestants throughout the previous day had made it possible for the killer to operate from the shadows once more allowing them to move undetected between rooms and corridors via hidden panels and passageways, known only to a few. White Admiral was out cold in the games room. This the killer had witnessed firsthand, and made for an easy target. But it wasn't the inebriated man's turn. No, the assassin had a different target in mind. The mutilation of False Widow's body had been a clue as to the host's next target. The meat of the clue— lay beneath the plastic bag over False Widow's head. If the contestants had ventured to remove that death shroud, they would have discovered the victim's eyes and ears missing, an undertaking intended to implicate Nightcrawler, the worm. The very excellent job the killer had done of severing False Widow's torso at the waist was merely the icing on the cake, suggestive of the work of a spade in the garden. The host was reveling in their work, taking a great deal of pleasure from it, Sure, the act of killing False Widow was satisfying, but the mutilation of her lukewarm body afterwards was exhilarating. The bit with the garden shears had been absolutely sensational. And it was with a tremendous sense of excitement and vigor that the murderer had continued along the empty corridor, crossed the grand hall, and tiptoed into the reception hall, where Nightcrawler, the tall, dark-haired man, lay flat on the floor besides the flickering fire a pillow from one of the room's many sofas beneath his head. In his hand, he still clutched a half-glass of brandy, some of which had spilled onto the floor. The killer knew he would be there, for the figure had watched him drift off into slumber several hours earlier. He lay precisely where the killer's dragon had been crafted. How symbolic it would have been to have done away with Scarlet Darter in that very spot. The spit and crackle of the fire had disguised the killer's soft tread, the slowly the figure crept in the direction of the sleeper. The storm without was in full force, the whistling of the wind a living thing beyond the window panes. But Nightcrawler heard neither, heard nothing whatsoever. The host crouched beside him, withdrawing a syringe and a hypodermic needle. The murderer watched over the unwitting victim, studied the look of peace and tranquility upon his sleeping face, listened to the calming sound of his uninterrupted breathing— the rhythmical rising and falling of the chest. And it was with the softest of voices that the host began to hum that eerie tune again. Out it rose, that appalling, dissonant melody, horribly harmonized with the storm without. And then, 
Slowly, with great care and attention, the killer inserted the hypodermic needle into a bulging vein, clearly visible on the side of Nightcrawler's unprotected neck. He grunted briefly, but, suitably sedated by the brandy, the breaking of the skin elicited no further sounds. Administering the ominous contents of the syringe, the host grinned. In the moments that followed, the killer retreated, backing up against the north wall, sliding effortlessly between two towering cabinets. From the gloom, the host had watched as Nightcrawler began to yield to the dreadful concoction of chemicals coursing through his veins. He convulsed, and then, involuntarily in his sleep, he started to scratch about his neck, right where the injection had been administered. The glass in his hand was tossed aside, and then he was groaning, in and out of consciousness, the itching sensation evidently spreading throughout his entire being. He shot up with a jolt, and there, by the fire, he tore at his shirt, pulling it away from his body, which, as evidenced by the way in which he manically clawed at the skin about his chest and belly, was more than mildly irritated. He stumbled to his feet, danced a death jig, and a look of horror filled the tall man's face, as right before the eyes of the killer, Nightcrawler's arms and face began to swell. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. He was lost in a living nightmare, at a total loss as to where to go, what to do, and what to think. Up and down the length of the reception hall he slipped and scuttled, his swollen feet refusing him the liberty to walk. His head resembled a pumpkin, a bloated purple pumpkin, fit to burst. On hands and knees, the once towering individual managed to crawl out into the grand hall, made it ten feet or so to the bottom of the stairs, and collapsed onto his back, no longer capable of progress. And there, coughing and splattering, the veins in his face lit up like the lights on the Christmas tree beside him. Nightcrawler lay dying. And the last thing he had seen had been a familiar face, belonging to a figure that had crouched beside him and placed something on the floor. The discovery of Nightcrawler's body later that same morning was met with a confusing combination of both shock and resignation. But the clue, White Admiral deliberated, his head still pounding. What was the clue? Clue? Andrina all but shrieked. You are still thinking about clues? Andrina aside, the other contestants were all thinking about clues, knowing that in all probability their very survival depended on it. But Andrina, her face pale with fear, was no longer willing to play the game no longer willing to associate with those among her she feared were potentially capable of committing the horrifying crime she'd witnessed during murder at Miller's Manor. The middle-aged lady took off in the direction of her quarters. The other contestants couldn't have known it then, but that would be the last time they ever saw the lady who had so warmed them with her glowing smile and radiant demeanour during the early days of the event. "'What? What the hell do we do now?' White Admiral stammered his eyes glued to the caricature of a man that lay at his feet. Blue Bottle attempted to vocalize a response, but nothing legible left his lips. Black Garden's face was something to behold. Deep lines had appeared on his forehead, surmounting a countenance utterly fixed in a ghastly grimace. "'We've got to get out of here,' he said simply, his appalling expression unchanging. "'But we can't get out of here,' White Admiral reminded him, gesturing towards the vast windows at the top of the grand staircase. Look at it out there, and it's got to be five below. Shouldn't we at least try? asked New Forest. Try? White Admiral repeated cynically. And head in which direction, pray tell? New Forest hesitated. I have no idea, she admitted. A period of silence followed, in which each of the four participants considered the question of orientation. It doesn't matter. We should try anyway, Black Garden said. If it hasn't escaped your attention, we're dropping like flies here. Who's going to be next, and when? At the mention of flies, Blue Bottle found his voice at last. Flies, he muttered, drawing the attention of the others. We missed the clue with False Widow, whatever it was supposed to be. It's much too late to dwell on that. But shouldn't we be taking a closer look at Nightcrawler while we still can? Or we could talk about the elephant in the room— this, from White Admiral, 
who was eyeballing his fellow contestants with that suspicious gaze of his. "'And what's that?' Blackgarden asked. "'The killer,' White Admiral answered. "'Which one of you is it?' Another stony silence followed. It had crossed the minds of everybody present on more than one occasion. "'What makes you think it's one of us?' New Forest asked. "'It has to be, doesn't it?' White Admiral returned. "'And I'm including Andrina in this. We're the only ones left.' "'Fair enough,' blurted Bluebottle. "'But what about the missing? Grey Dagger, Longhorn, Yellow Jacket, Scarlet Darter? How can you be sure that it isn't one of them that's responsible for what's happening here? I mean, it was you who kept going on about stooges.' "'That was before people started dying,' White Admiral yelled. Bluebottle shook his head. "'Listen,' he said, lowering his tone. "'Look around you.' And he gestured towards Black Garden and New Forest, as well as himself. Do you really see a killer here? That goes for Andrina, too, the woman so frightened that she's gone and locked herself in her room. White Admiral backed down, hearing truth in Blue Bottle's words. For several moments, the four contestants just stood there, Black Garden and Blue Bottle eyeballing the corpse in their midst, New Forest and White Admiral gazing off into space. It was New Forest who broke the silence. The needle, she muttered. The injection. What might it represent? Oh, I don't know, mumbled Black Garden. A bee sting? A wasp sting? Highly unlikely, seeing as though Yellow Jacket is no longer among us. And a discussion followed, there by the bloated body of Nightcrawler, regarding the names of the remaining contestants, and what they might represent. It was concluded that White Admiral represented a butterfly, Blue Bottle, of course, a common fly, and Black Garden, according to New Forest, an ant. As for what the names New Forest and Andrina represented, none could say. New Forest suggested a trip to the library, in order to scour its vast contents for books on the subject of entomology and the like, but Blue Bottle vetoed the idea, bringing the group's attention to what he considered to be work of a more pressing nature. And so, as per Blue Bottle's prompting, the four contestants saw to it that False Widow's door remained closed, they couldn't bear the thought of moving what was left of her, and that the poor, swollen body of Nightcrawler was taken out into the snow, to be placed, approximately, alongside the body of Green Drake. The latter was an especially difficult task, as the snow, once more, had created new and formidable snowdrifts. The four of them struggled against the violent winds, and learned, in doing so, that an attempt to walk out into the storm in order to escape Miller's Manor would be all but impossible. Andrina remained in her quarters throughout the day, responding with firm refusals when attempts to rouse her were made at her bedroom door. The others, fearful but relatively self-assured, remained in each other's company well into the early hours of the morning, doing everything in their power to talk each other out of their respective suspicions. Alcohol was avoided, each of them spooked by Nightcrawler's fate following his overindulgence the previous evening, and White Admiral, surprisingly, was all too happy to give his customary boozing a miss, under the circumstances. But the question remained as to just who it was that was behind the atrocious things that were happening to them. So familiar were they becoming with each other, that they were unable to see anything but honesty in each other's eyes. Familiar, friendly honesty. It was much more conceivable that the person behind the killings was one of the missing, dagger, longhorn, jacket, or darter, particularly those among the first to disappear, the ones they hadn't got to know very well, the ones much more likely to be harbouring dark secrets and monstrous motivations. Now the task at hand was to look out for one another, to ensure that the mysterious agent wouldn't do away with anybody else. They thought long and hard about Nightcrawler's bloated corpse, each of them agreeing that a sting of some description was what the state of his poor body most likely signified. Was Yellow Jacket, the wasp, still at large? Was there a bee among their number? Or was it pointing at something else beyond their reckoning? If the clue did suggest Yellow Jacket, then was it, in fact, a clue as to the identity of the killer, as opposed to the identity of the next victim? With only suppositions to work with, it was impossible to form a reasonable plan of action. The game that was no longer a game was ambiguous, macabre, and deadly. It was with a great deal of trepidation and uncertainty that the guests retired that evening. Yet, somehow, 
Black Garden, Blue Bottle, New Forest, and White Admiral were fortunate enough to make it through the night, which, in light of what had been happening, was nothing short of miraculous. Andrina, however, who had locked herself away for the entirety of January 2nd, was nowhere to be found when her counterparts attempted to wake her on the morning of January 3rd. Chapter 10 Andrina January 3rd, 1990 Andrina couldn't take it. The stress of her predicament was overwhelming. Disappearances, bodies, murder. Such things were beyond her experience. Sitting alone in her quarters, the only place that even approached the notion of a sanctuary, Andrina had gazed out of the window that overlooked a vast, barren expanse, ignoring the calls made at her door throughout January 2nd. She watched with something like longing as the snowflakes descended before her, wished, albeit fleetingly, that she were one of those flakes, unburdened by the affairs of human beings. The middle-aged lady had abandoned all hope of surviving murder at Miller's Manor. So she waited, waited until the other contestants, whoever those people really were, had retired to their rooms a little after two in the morning, and then, quietly, slipped out of her quarters. Her destination was the kitchen door. She knew the others had been out there again, disposing of Nightcrawler's body. Blue Bottle had informed her of this during one of his many visits to check in on her, and was reasonably sure the door would still be unlocked. She stole along the gallery, descended the stairs, crossed the grand hall, and entered the deserted kitchen. So far gone was Andrina, that she paid little heed to the menacing shadows that surrounded her. The dark pockets of open space, the claustrophobic corners, were of no consequence to the determined lady. Her goal eclipsed all else, and that goal was to walk out into the night, right into the snowstorm, to become one with the snowflakes, to hell with the consequences. Just after 2.15 a.m., the lady who had drawn the codename Andrina, the name of the common mining bee, opened the kitchen door, and, in nothing but a nightgown, wandered carelessly into the whiteout. Later that same morning, the remaining participants, Black Garden, Blue Bottle, New Forest, and White Admiral, had known nothing of Andrina's decision to walk out into the wilderness. They assumed, naturally, upon confirming her disappearance, that the once jovial lady was the latest victim of the killer, oft in a manner similar to the other missing guests. The fact that her coat, shoes, and other essential items of clothing were still present in her quarters didn't strike them as particularly odd, given what they had thus far endured. With his practical head on, Black Garden proposed another search of the extensive property, a search to be conducted by the four of them together. The others obliged, and the rest of the morning was spent traversing the entirety of the manor, including the dank basement, in which the lighting was dim, and into which Blue Bottle, following his previous search of the labyrinthine lower level, feared to descend. Dark storage rooms and interminable passageways were explored, but after a good half an hour of fruitless roving, it was determined that nothing of value would be found down there in the blackness. It was on a hunch that White Admiral suggested a more thorough search of the library, as he'd never fully dismissed Longhorn's deception on the 27th, when, instead of heading to the bathroom, she'd crept towards the library. He'd been unable to recall with absolute certainty who it was that had located the book in the yellow dust jacket smeared with blood, but New Forest was quick to point out that it was in fact her, and together— the four of them returned to the very spot in which the fateful item was discovered. "'What was she doing here that evening?' White Admiral asked of no one in particular. "'Could she have been meeting someone?' New Forest offered. "'Another guest, perhaps?' "'It's possible,' Blue Bottle put in. "'And I have to admit, it would make sense for more than one person to be involved in this whole thing.' "'It would,' White Admiral agreed. "'But who?' "'To figure that out,' Black Garden said." We'd have to establish who else was in the kitchen that night. Was anybody missing? Other than Grey Dagger, you mean? New Forest quizzed. Obviously. Black Garden returned, but he knew all too well that there was nothing obvious about anything concerning murder at Miller's Manor. They each thought long and hard about the numerous hours spent in the kitchen on the evening of the 27th. 
They focused on the conversations, the stories shared, the food consumed, the drinks glugged, but in the end, they were each forced to admit that it was impossible to verify the whereabouts of any given contestant at any given time throughout the evening in question. There were too many variables, most of which revolved around the consumption of alcohol. "'What about you, anyway?' Black Garden started, eyeballing White Admiral. "'What about me? How is it you remember Longhorn excusing herself, anyway? Were you ogling her or something, waiting for an opportunity to make a move?' "'Make a move?' White Admiral echoed. "'What are you trying to say?' "'I'm saying that perhaps you're leading us down a dark alley. Maybe you didn't see her slip away at all. Maybe it was you who slipped away.' "'No, wait a minute,' White Admiral started, only to be interrupted by Black Garden. "'No, you wait a minute. It's all starting to make sense now. You, endlessly going on about stooges, endlessly pointing the finger.' and always with a glass of brandy in your hand, trying to pull the wool over our eyes. You're no drunk. I bet you barely even touch the stuff. Come on, man, settle down, Blue Bottle said, attempting to defuse the situation. But Black Garden was becoming increasingly convinced that he was on to something. And yesterday, he continued, rising to a fever pitch, you actually stood there and openly asked which of us was the killer. Which of us? But it's you, isn't it? White Admiral was sweating. Beads of the stuff peppered his brow. Y "'You've got to be joking,' he said, his voice faltering. "'Of course it isn't me. How, how could it be me?' "'The evidence just keeps piling up!' Black Garden all but shrieked. "'You were the first to arrive, too, weren't you? That's pretty bloody convenient!' "'Okay, th that's enough.' This from New Forest, who, like Blue Bottle, had noticed the sweat on White Admiral's brow." Notice the way he'd started to withdraw, the way the colour had drained out of his face. "'It's him, for God's sake!' Black Garden blurted. But there was something wrong with the target of his accusations. Killer or not, it was clear that he was having trouble catching his breath, was finding it difficult to get his words out. "'Oh, yeah, here we go,' Black Garden muttered cynically. "'I—I—I I, I can't—can't can't breathe!' White Admiral stammered, collapsing against the bookcase to his rear, gasping for air. "'What's wrong?' Blue Bottle probed, as the large man clutched at his chest. "'Is it your heart?' But White Admiral could no longer respond. All he could do was squirm and gasp, as tremendous chest pains took hold of him. Black Garden watched with a mixture of confusion and horror. He'd been so totally convinced of White Admiral's guilt that— now, as he watched the man struggle to hold on to life, he had no idea whether to intervene or to leave his suspect to die. Within a matter of seconds, White Admiral was horizontal and unconscious. "'Do either of you know CPR?' yelled New Forest, but her question was immediately met with a pair of shaking heads. The diminutive blonde attempted to administer CPR herself, her small hands repeatedly pressing upon the large man's chest. When she'd exhausted her efforts, Blue Bottle tried to imitate her actions, but he too lacked the necessary know-how to be of any use to the heart attack victim. White Admiral lay as still as the books by which he rested. Black Garden knelt down and checked his pulse. The man was dead. And then there were three. With the familiarity of routine, Blue Bottle and Black Garden saw to it that White Admiral's body was taken outside and placed in the vicinity of Green Drake and Nightcrawler. Afterwards, the remaining contestants returned to the library, and, at the reading table, in the presence of the guidebook or the crimes of the hypothetical somebody, wondered if, after all, Black Garden had been right in his surmise regarding White Admiral. And don't forget, it was White Admiral who found Nightcrawler's body, the first of us to find a body alone, Blue Bottle recapped, keen to corroborate Black Garden's assumption. Absolutely, Black Garden stated matter of factly. Does that mean it's over? Blue Bottle muttered sheepishly. Fools and the foolish, New Forest warned, in a manner intended to remind her counterparts of the dangers of making assumptions. I, for one, will err on the side of caution. The look she gave the men in her company was one of good old fashioned mistrust, and she had a point. Five contestants were still unaccounted for, and, despite everything Black Garden had said, mostly to White Admiral's face, his accusations were based solely on circumstantial evidence. 
Guilt crept up his spine, as, in the light of the doubt cast on his supposition, he felt himself responsible for the big man's untimely death. The three of them, Black Garden, Blue Bottle, and New Forest, were in for a sleepless night. Chapter 11 New Forest January 4th, 1990 The remaining contestants, of which there were three, New Forest, Black Garden, and the unwitting latecomer Blue Bottle, suffering from a combination of fear and fatigue, finally arose from their slumbers just after noon on January 4th. New Forest, the first of the three to step out onto the open gallery that afternoon, tapped upon the doors of Blue Bottle and Black Garden, and the three of them, suitably exhausted, headed to the kitchen. Although they had each remembered to drink over the preceding few days, none of them had been able to so much as think about food. And so, duly ravenous, the trio, in surprisingly good spirits, cooked up a hot breakfast, consisting of bacon, sausages, eggs, and tomatoes. There was a calm about the mansion that afternoon. The snow was still falling outside, but it was no longer accompanied by the howling, violent wind. Despite the notion of the missing contestants, the bodies outside, and the unfortunate remains of false widow, who still lay on the floor of her bedroom in two distinct pieces, the survivors were able to discuss their situation rationally, still hopeful that White Admiral, who was no longer with them, had indeed been the killer. New Forest had once again proffered a search of the library, in order to seek out tomes on the subject of entomology and into the depths of the space the trio had plunged, seeking high and low for literature on the study of invertebrates and the like. It was an exhaustive effort, culminating in a number of appropriate texts, though the books sourced, focusing chiefly on arachnids, praying mantids, and true bugs, were of little use to the remaining contestants. Blue Bottle, particularly, was suspicious as to the number of books that appeared to be missing from the numerous shelves. Had certain books been strategically removed? It was much later, as twilight descended, that Blue Bottle had been in the act of approaching the fireplace in the reception hall in order to relight the fire, when he spotted something on the mantelpiece. Upon closer inspection, he discovered a small metal object. It was a key, a small padlock key. Immediately, Blue Bottle's mind returned to his investigation of the mysterious outhouse several days earlier, the building that had been padlocked. He called to Black Garden and New Forest, who had both been changing upstairs, and insisted that their next port of call be the outhouse, in order to test a supposition. With the last light of day dancing overhead, he was eager to try the key in the padlock while visibility was still good. Assenting, the trio armed themselves with coats and, via the kitchen door, stepped out into the snow. The calm they'd experienced indoors was amplified outdoors. In every direction their gazes fell upon pure whiteness. The blanket of snow absorbed all sound. Nothing could be heard beyond the crunching of the white stuff beneath their feet. They trod a near invisible path that, without the previous efforts of Blue Bottle and Company, would have been impossible to traverse. There was an eeriness about their journey, too, as none of them could forget that there were bodies out there, the victims of a murderer that— quite possibly, if their suspicions regarding White Admiral proved to be incorrect, could still be at large. But with every step they took in the direction of the distant outhouse, the threat of another blizzard increased, the light of day continued to fade, and the sky overhead steadily welcomed the return of pink, swollen clouds. The wind was picking up, too, soaring across the snowscape, disturbing the myriad soft snowflakes that lay on the surface. Approaching the outhouse, Blue Bottle withdrew the key. Here we go, he muttered, as his rapidly cooling fingers fumbled with the frozen padlock. Scraping the ice away from its outer surface, he worked the lock for a few seconds and then, click. Bingo, he said victoriously, removing the padlock from the door handles. The wind was positively howling now, surely an omen, a warning from a greater force, acting with their best interests at heart and fresh snowflakes followed in abundance, eager to hold the progress of the remaining contestants. But, heedless of the ethereal warning, looking to Black Garden and New Forest for encouragement, Blue Bottle gripped the handles and pushed the large doors open. 
When he'd first spotted the outhouse several days earlier, Blue Bottle had hoped to find something useful inside, a means of escape, perchance. No such luck. Within, a strange scene awaited the three guests. As the waning light, barely capable of penetrating the vast sheets of snow that were now coming down, poured into the open barn, it illuminated a space some twenty feet squared, the surface of which was composed entirely of soil. In the middle of the space, several paces ahead, the trio beheld three upturned buckets. On the far wall, to the rear of the buckets, was pinned a large poster with the words, What Lies Beneath, printed upon it. "'What the hell is this?' asked New Forest, her eyes drawn to both the words on the poster and the upturned buckets on the ground below. "'I—I don't know,' Black Garden returned tremulously. Ignoring the buckets, Blue Bottle took off towards the poster and tore it from the wall. Sketched on the wooden boards behind it were the words, The Black Garden, in a curious crimson fluid. Blue Bottle turned to eyeball Black Garden, who responded to his accusing eyes with a slow shake of his head. "'Just what is going on here?' Blue Bottle yelled at him. "'I—I I said—I uh, I already said I don't know,' he stammered. But New Forest had lost interest in Blue Bottle, Black Garden, and the curious message on the wall. Her attention was acutely focused on the three upturned buckets. "'Guys,' she said, moving towards the leftmost bucket. Don't, Black Garden begged. Don't do it. Why not? Blue Bottle quizzed, his tone accusing. Something under there you don't want us to see? But New Forest paid no heed to the exchange. She knelt down, and in one rapid motion, flipped over the leftmost bucket. Oh, my! Blue Bottle started, but couldn't finish. Recoiling, New Forest covered her mouth with both hands. Black Garden simply remained where he was, motionless. Protruding from the soil, pale and drawn, planted in the ground like a young seedling, was the head of Grey Dagger, the first of the missing. What should have given Blue Bottle pause spurred him on. We have to know who else is under there, he said, and lunged for the middle bucket. He flipped it over and moved to New Forest's side in order to observe. The motionless, rubbery head of Yellow Jacket gazed back at them planted, just like her neighbour. And then it was Black Garden's turn to step forward. He did so hesitantly, but felt, somewhere deep down in his being, that it was his duty. Like an arachnophobe inspecting the contents of a shoe covered in cobwebs, he flipped the third bucket over and leapt backwards, letting out an involuntary shriek as he did so. The mustachioed face of Scarlet Data was revealed, his features dull and waxen. Longhorn! Blue Bottle yelled. The killer! It's, it's fucking Longhorn! Longhorn. The word went round and round in his mind. It hadn't been White Admiral after all. As a matter of fact, White Admiral had witnessed her deception, watched as she slipped away that evening to leave clues in the library. In all likelihood, she'd waited until Grey Dagger had fulfilled her role as the first stooge, and then removed her from the picture altogether in order to operate from the shadows alone to leave the clues she wanted to leave when she wanted to leave them. Blue Bottle was convinced Longhorn was the host, and she was insane. But where was she now? What was she waiting for? She'd wanted them to discover the Black Garden, wanted to reveal her identity as host in the most appalling of ways, wanted them to look upon the dead faces of the other suspects, and Blue Bottle's mind returned to the guidebook. Catch the killer, and the killer will crown you victor. Did he have enough to prove it was Longhorn? Enough to catch her, as it were? None of them had seen her following her disappearance. There had been no evidence whatsoever of her being present in the manor after her so-called death. Could he be absolutely convinced she was the killer? But it was just as Blue Bottle contemplated his theory that Black Garden took off running into the whiteout. Wait! Blue Bottle shouted, all too aware that the spooked contestant had no intention of heading back to Miller's Manor. Where are you going? Taking one last look at New Forest and the decomposing heads in the soil, Blue Bottle darted after the fleeing guest. New Forest followed suit, and, moments later, the three remaining contestants of murder at Miller's Manor 
found themselves running blind in a snowstorm, the likes of which none of them had ever encountered before. Chapter 12 Black Garden December 13th, 2019 Richard Ike, a.k.a. Blue Bottle, leaned back in his chair, thoroughly exhausted, after detailing, as best his memory allowed, the traumatic events that transpired at the remote and isolated Miller's Manor some thirty years earlier. His interlocutor, the author, Annabel Franklin, poured each of them a glass of water, and patiently awaited the culmination of the survivor's account. The whiteout was disorientating, he said, eyeballing Franklin. I lost Black Garden's prints almost immediately. Above the wail of the wind, I heard New Forest calling to me. Blue Bottle, she repeated, over and over. But soon enough, she was as lost to me as Black Garden. Franklin just listened, her thick-rimmed glasses perched on the edge of her nose. I must have been out there for twenty minutes, stumbling, screaming at the top of my voice. I felt like the last man on earth. He exhaled deeply, before continuing. Somehow, despite the blizzard, I found myself by the north wall of the manor. I skirted the perimeter in what I hoped was the direction of the kitchen door, and soon enough I found it and threw myself inside. I made my way into the reception hall, clumsily lit the fire, and sat there, shivering, half frozen to death. Ike paused, studying his left hand, the one upon which only a thumb and forefinger remained. I warmed myself by the fire what felt like forever— my eyes continually drawn to the shadowy corners of the reception hall, anticipating an attack from the killer, Longhorn. Franklin adjusted her glasses, watching the speaker closely. So engrossed was the author, that she'd neglected to add substantial portions of Ike's account to the hefty notebook on the table in front of her. But the house was silent, utterly dead, the survivor continued. I sat there, praying that Black Garden and New Forest would make it back inside, but— they never did. The man once known as Blue Bottle paused again, to take a well-earned sip of water from the glass in front of him. And it was about then that I noticed something, he continued. On the bureau along the north wall, I saw that a book had been placed there, a large book in green hardback. I knew instinctively that it was the guidebook, the crimes of the hypothetical somebody, but when exactly it had been placed there, I had no idea. I climbed to my feet, still shivering, and approached it. Sure enough, it was exactly what I suspected. And there, in the same handwriting, a new message had been left for whoever was unlucky enough to find it. Uh-huh, Franklin prompted, eagerly. It said, and I'm paraphrasing here, as you know, the book was never recovered, something like, and then there were two, who is it, me or you? Franklin, inspired, jotted the phrase down in her notebook. I read those words, Ike continued, and all of a sudden I just knew that I needed to get out of there, that the unnavigable terrain, the snowstorm, the cold, all of it would be preferable to an encounter with Longhorn. And so I took off, never looking back. Back out of the kitchen door I went, straight into the storm, and I just kept going, trudging through the snow with every ounce of strength I had left. Ike sighed, looking at his left hand once again. How I made it back to the A6 on foot, uh, I'll never know. Pure luck, I guess. If that plough hadn't been out so early the morning of the 5th, I, I would have surely frozen to death. And I guess you've got to be grateful for small mercies. <laughs> the frostbite was limited to my hands and feet. But you already know all that. Franklin nodded. Having listened with great interest to Ike's exclusive account, the author questioned him with regards to the subsequent police investigation. Well, again, as you know, he said, nobody had known I was up there. Nobody had any reason to question where I might be. I wasn't due to return to work till the 6th, and I lived alone. I was independent and stubborn. It, it wasn't unusual for me to go weeks on end without contacting my friends and family. This fact, though, coupled with my unlikely story, was met with a great deal of suspicion when I shared it with the police. Ike laughed emptily. But, sure enough, intrigued by the state I was in there in the hospital bed, they went out to Miller's Manor the same day, and it wasn't long before they were back at my side, scrutinizing me. Ike and Franklin went on to discuss the discovery of the bodies. 
The first body discovered by the police, as per Ike's directions, was the mutilated body of False Widow, real name Maria Winter Botham, a 41-year-old environmental health officer from Derby. Investigators had been at a loss to comprehend the dedication and determination of a killer capable of severing the body at the waist with a pair of, albeit unusually sharp, garden shears. But what none of us had known at the time, Ike said on the subject, was that the poor woman's eyes had been gouged out, and her ears had been cut off, which of course suggested to me that there was a clue in there somewhere that we'd missed. Franklin nodded. The second, third, and fourth bodies to be discovered, again as per Ike's directions, were the frozen remains of Green Drake, a Mancunian man of Asian descent whose real name was Carkit Lee, the bloated form of Nightcrawler, a.k.a. William Clark, a thirty-two-year-old chef de party from Leeds, and White Admiral, real name Brian Gallagher, a forty-three-year-old warehouse operative from Sheffield. On the subject of Green Drake, Ike said, the discovery of the cup in Lee's en suite came as something of a shock. We'd all assumed he'd been poisoned at the dinner table. Ricin, wasn't it? Franklin proffered. A substantial amount, apparently. The partial toxicology report, leaked in late ninety, was, was very telling. Most of the victims had been poisoned in the first instance, and, in the cases of Lee and Gallagher, had been poisoned gradually. Gallagher's dreadful hangovers, it would seem, were due to more than just the booze. Makes you wonder what else was found in their systems. And yet, nothing was found in your system, Franklin added. Ike nodded, saying, I've pondered that mystery for years. The survivor proceeded to outline what he knew of the investigators' ensuing search of the outhouse, wherein the bodies of the fifth, sixth, and seventh victims were located. The Lancastrian stooge, Grey Dagger, real name Joanne Burton, a twenty-two-year-old aspiring actress, Yellow Jacket, a.k.a. Helen Ferguson, a housewife of thirty-three years from Salford, who had also, according to her husband, partaken in the event as a stooge, and the mustachioed Eastern European, Scarlet Darter, real name Art Chaklowski. Try as I might, Ike muttered, I'll never be able to get the image of the three of them planted there in the soil out of my head. They were on display, like a collector might have displayed them. Franklin nodded knowingly. The killer, according to official sources, had accessed the grisly barn by means of a shorter, less circuitous route than the one initially cleared by Ike and Co. A pair of cellar doors were located a mere stone's throw from the outhouse, to which the killer, with great effort, was able to drag the bodies of the victims through the snow and into the external building. Regarding the fates of the other contestants, Ike had only learned some weeks after his escape, when a number of officers and volunteers guided as they were by Ike's statements, had made an extensive search of the grounds and hills surrounding Miller's Manor. The eighth victim, it turned out, had been a victim of the storm. Andrina, who was revealed to be a fifty-seven-year-old copywriter from Nottingham by the name of Elizabeth Brooks, was found crouched beneath a lone tree some three hundred metres from the manor, wearing nothing but a nightgown. Exposure had killed her. I've always wondered what Longhorn made of Andrina's decision to walk out into the storm that night. In retrospect, having later learned of the Andrina mining bee, it seemed to me that Nightcrawler's death had implicated her. And then he added rhetorically, did she save Longhorn some work, or scupper her plans? The ninth body to be discovered belonged to Anthony Thomas, a.k.a. Black Garden, a twenty-seven-year-old bus driver from Utoxeter. Thomas had suffered from a blow to the head, concluded the medical examiner assigned to the case, and later, in his report, the coroner listed blunt force trauma as the cause of Thomas's death. As you're no doubt aware, Ike remarked, Thomas was discovered a mere stone's throw from the outhouse. It's uncanny, I must have run right by him. She was there, just outside, waiting to do away with two of us. Two of you? Franklin asked for clarification. Well, Yes, I confirmed. As per what was written in the guidebook when I returned to the manor, it was clear only one of us was meant to return from the outhouse. Franklin glanced at her notes. Do you have a theory as to the whereabouts of Longhorn? The author continued. Well, uh, as was revealed by the police during the course of their investigation, uh, again, as I'm sure you already know, the individual who arranged the event at Miller's Manor never actually met with the manor's proprietors. Jason Harrison, the booking agent, who acted on behalf of the anonymous host, 
was only ever able to offer one piece of information, that he spoke with a female over the telephone. And, as you know, the postal orders used to finance the event were never traced back to anybody. She was clever, that one. Left nothing to chance. And you suppose she's been in hiding all these years? Franklin asked. I wouldn't put anything past Longhorn, he answered. And New Forest? Franklin continued. Any idea what might have happened to her? She's a missing person, Ike stated. They never found her body. But if Thomas's fate is anything to go by, then Longhorn probably bludgeoned her to death and hid the body. Again, Franklin glanced at her notes, then asked, Strange that nothing found in either her or Longhorn's quarters afterwards shed any light on their identities, though, right? Yeah, Ike admitted. But then again, the same could be said of Art Chaklowski. If his body hadn't been recovered, there would have been very little to go on indeed. The subject of the twelfth guest was raised. The individual Ike had unwittingly replaced in stumbling upon the event that fateful night in 1989. Mark Jackson, Ike said. As you know, he was a suspect for a brief period. But, as was soon verified, he decided not to make the journey to Miller's Manor that afternoon. It would have been a long, snowy drive from Bangor. Yet, ironically, Franklin put in, Jackson died at the wheel in ninety-five, did he not? Yeah, Ike said. His brakes had been tampered with, apparently. And he shuddered, adding, I don't like to think about it. Franklin nodded sympathetically. Speaking of vehicles, she continued, do you have any thoughts regarding the missing cars? During their initial sweep of the crime scene, investigators had uncovered nine vehicles on the vast, snow-covered driveway. I could found this difficult to comprehend, as he'd been sure each of the contestants had driven themselves to the event. If so, three cars were unaccounted for, vehicles belonging to Longhorn, New Forest, and Scarlet Darter. Following the discovery and identification of Archaklowski's body, it was later verified that he had in fact driven to the event, and that his car wasn't among those found at Miller's Manor. As far as Chaklowski's car is concerned, Ike began, Longhorn must have moved it prior to my arrival, when the roads were still navigable. I think she probably planned to do something to the other cars, too, but once the storm took hold, she was spared the effort. There was no way in hell any of us were driving out of there. I mean, you must remember it. The Big Freeze of 1990, they called it. Franklin nodded. As for Longhorn and New Forest, Ike continued, I've always just assumed that they arrived by other means. It's impossible to know for sure. As the sole survivor of the Miller's Manor Massacre finished speaking, Annabel Franklin, the author in the thick-brimmed glasses, muttered something under her breath that both shocked and disturbed him. The words that left her lips were so devastating in what they implied that Richard Ike felt her phantom tingling in his missing extremities, and his body perceptibly shook for what she had said had thrust him back into the past, back into the confines of the oppressive Miller's Manor, the nightmare mansion in which he'd looked death in the eye and lived to tell the tale. The utterance had been this, fools and the foolish. And as his mind reeled from the import of those haunting woods, Annabel Franklin, in a manner quite unlike that of the first time Arthur Ike had met at his door early that December evening, eyeballed him intensely, and carefully removed the plain dust jacket covering the notebook on the table in front of her. Beneath that glossy camouflage had hidden, in plain sight, a very familiar book, a large book in green hardback, The Crimes of the Hypothetical Somebody. Ike wanted to ask where the author had found it, wanted to ask what it was doing in her possession, but he couldn't move, he couldn't speak, an all-consuming fear took possession of him. There, with the book open before her, Franklin flicked through its time-worn pages. Ike saw the provocative title, the illustration featuring the twelve guests surrounding the reading table in the library, and then caught some of the words sketched by the killer. Listen long and hear my song. We've met before, you and I. Perhaps I'm plain, ordinary. Who am I? Stranger to you all. Besides you, right now, you've a killer to catch. And as he read the words, and then there were two, who will it be, me or you? Franklin looked up at him, and removed her glasses. It was her, the killer, 
She'd come for him at last. But he couldn't move. Why couldn't he move? Then he looked at the glass on the table, the glass of ever so slightly cloudy water Franklin had so courteously poured for him. The author grinned. And in that grin he saw the truth. She was older now, of course, but that grin gave it all away. Because he knew that grin well, had seen it more than once. And it didn't belong to Longhorn. He knew that for sure, for the two of them had spent just two brief days together. He could barely recall her face. Besides, the phrase fools and the foolish could be attributed to only one of the other contestants. Through lips that all but refused to open, Ike managed. It's you, New Forest. Smiling, the older and barely recognizable face of the lady once known to him as New Forest, said, Congratulations, Blue Bottle. You caught me. And she glanced at the glass of water in front of him. Ike, just as he had stumbled upon murder at Miller's Manor three decades earlier, had unwittingly caught the killer in the act. The man bristled at the implications. Rising, the author collected the handbag that had lain beside her throughout the evening, and, slowly, approached the man she had so stealthily poisoned. What happened? To Longhorn, the dying man managed. Oh, you came close, the killer answered. Such a vast basement, wasn't it? The perfect place to conceal a disposable stooge. How freely they came, those stooges, how quietly they died. False walls, hidden rooms, never to be revealed. Longhorn was something of a loner. She left no record of her decision to attend murder at Miller's Manor. She's listed as a missing person up there in Manchester. Isn't it incredible that your description of the killer has never been linked to her? New Forest chuckled. The setup was executed perfectly, she continued, right up to the moment of Green Drake's death at the dinner table. Oh, the looks on your little faces when the man passed away. How the doubt established itself in that moment. The fear. Perfection. But why? Why us? Ike mumbled. You shouldn't have been there, Richard, she stated. But you were, and I'm glad you were. The others, well. Haven't you worked that out by now? And the blank stare the killer received in response answered her question. Willing prey, she said simply. And no, Andrina's decision to end it all didn't scupper a thing. We each of us have our triggers, Richard. I... I don't... I don't understand, the ailing man murmured. Imagine a life, Richard, she continued. The life of a quiet lady, hurt by many, completely forgotten so afraid of the world at large that she grows to fear it, to hate it. She turns to the mini-beasts, the butterflies, the spiders, the beetles, the worms, collects them, controls them. She discovers the new forest cicada, in whose existence her own is beautifully reflected, and, deifying it, mimics the cicada, crowning herself queen of the mini-beasts. But she's mean to those beneath her, spiteful and cruel. She taunts them tortures them, swats them dead. And it isn't enough. It's never enough. Do you know why? With great effort, Richard Ike shook his head. Because the mini-beasts aren't responsible for the pain she feels. The real bugs and critters are out there in the so-called civilized world. The ones who scuttle past her on the street without so much as a hello. The ones who crawl over her on the road and in the supermarkets the ones who meet her gaze with glazed-over eyes, the ones who neglect to acknowledge her very existence. The maniacal lady bared her teeth and hissed. You are no different, Richard. She crept closer to her motionless victim, her eyes fixed upon his. But what? Why the game? Why so elaborate a game? Ike croaked. With the exception of you, the murderer returned, I'd played with them before. A new forest had played with them before. Alongside a much younger and considerably less anxious White Admiral, a.k.a. Brian Gallagher, at Boiled at the Boiler Room 74 in Sheffield, with a twenty-something false widow, a.k.a. Maria Winterbotham, at Last Standing Lincoln, July 1975, beside Nightcrawler, a.k.a. William Clark, in the messy Scars of Scarborough event of 1978, 
alongside Andrina, a.k.a. Elizabeth Brooks, at Monsters at Montague Castle in Cambria, November 1979, with the ever-enthusiastic Green Drake, a.k.a. Carkit Lee, attending Who Done It at the Pumpkin House in October 1980, among a group that included Longhorn, whose real identity as Alison Gill would forever be New Forest Secret, at Middleton Mingling, July 1981, with the brooding Black Garden, a.k.a. Anthony Thomas, at the Southport Slashes event of 1984, alongside Yellow Jacket, a.k.a. Helen Ferguson, at Bolton's annual Burn the Goose event, January 1983, in the company of Scarlet Darter, a.k.a. Art Chaklowski, at the all-nighter Grantham Gamshoes 84, as a fellow stooge with Grey Dagger, a.k.a. Joanne Burton, at Buxton Manor's Halloween Haunting of 85, with the would-be Blue Bottle, a.k.a. Mark Jackson, at Who Killed Who in Cardiff, June 1986. Overnight friends who promised to call, short-term lovers who promised her love. But they'd all forgotten about her. They'd failed to recognize her upon their reunion at the manor, which, despite the incredible length she'd gone to in order to bring them together, was confirmation of what the troubled lady already knew to be true. She was invisible. She could go anywhere, do anything. She was forgettable, like the washing of one's hands. She was the hypothetical somebody, the one who didn't exist. Thirty years later, it had taken a stranger, an accidental man, to identify her, to solve the mystery of murder at Miller's Manor. Liars, cheaters, backstabbers, all of them, she yelled. In hosting murder at Miller's Manor, I was able, just as I had done with the mini-beasts, to taunt, torture, and swat those who had wronged me, wronged the Queen— Reaching into the handbag she carried, Annabel Franklin, a.k.a. New Forest, produced a crown of thorns, a dreadful metal garland beset with jagged, rusty nails, each of which pointed downwards, a trophy designed with two purposes in mind. But you caught me, Richard, caught me in the act, saw me, acknowledged me, made me actual again, and for that you will be rewarded." And as the demented woman lifted the crown above his head, she began to sing. It was a song she'd sung many times before, a terrible tune for those men and women who had poisoned her with their lies and unfulfilled promises. The melody soared above Richard Ike's motionless head in microtonal, dissonant waves, shrieks and hisses akin to the night song of insects, the chirping of crickets, the singing of cicadas. Listen long! And hear my song, the killer wailed. With extraordinary force, the crown was thrust atop Richard Ike's head, with the desired result. I crown you victor, Blue Bottle. He lived long enough to hear the lady's parting words. You will have pride of place in the new Black Garden. 